I bring it here? Yeah, yeah, you can bring it over if you want. Oh, is it okay? Yeah, yeah. Do it in the podcast. Yeah, bring it over. You don't want to be getting up during the podcast. No, 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 you're good. You're good. (laughs) So. I brought everything in case I have questions. (laughs) No, you're good. You're good. So, I have finally, I've been wanting to get Richie on for a while. And we finally made it happen. One of the best cut men in the world, you would say. uh, MMA, a lover of MMA, a trainer previous fighter yeah you were yeah amateur only though amateur in mma muay thai or no no boxing yeah boxing uh, yeah yeah and i did a tiny and, and i did some martial arts as well but you did that, that was when i was a lot younger yeah and when did you come to the realization that you wanted to work with cuts and like that kind of behind the scenes work um let me just what? fix this check and i fix this no check. no no yeah yeah get comfortable <laughs> yeah, get comfortable um uh, I, I, I got really lucky because when I came to South Australia, I had already been, I'd already started coaching uh, back in Ireland. And, yeah. I, I, and it's, not, it's not like it is now where you can go and do your, your level two boxing coaching badge and then just run away and open your own gym and become a coach. Back in the day, you had to be uh, you had to be nominated to be a coach. So you kind of had to coach for a bit, and then when you've coached for a bit, you would then get nominated to go and do your level two. Mm. So you had to be around the gym, holding pads, carrying the bucket, uh, learning the ropes as a coach. So uh, so I, I had just started out on that journey, you know, and. Um, and then we came to, to South Australia. So when we were in South Australia, I, I met up with a guy called Rod Davis, an, an old school boxing coach. And uh, he, couldn't, he couldn't get into the ring. So I had to get into the ring and he had to show me if someone got cut, how to work those cuts. So this old school boxing coach called uh, Rod Davis, he pretty much taught me everything. Mm-hmm. You know? So uh, yeah, and then I just... I grew with it, you know, like, so when I started coaching and I had my own fighters, you know, you learn, you learn how to wrap hands and, and because there was no, int- that, well, there was the internet, but there wasn't much out there. So it was just trial and error. Because you're, you're extremely good at it as well. Mm. Like you've, I've seen you cover up some fucking heinous cuts. Yeah. And pe- it, it would be such a skill that people don't understand. Yeah, it's like funny. people would think you're just rubbing Vaseline on them and fucking just putting that, like just <laughs> covering up the cuts. There's so much to it. Yeah, the thing, the main thing about it is, is, is the time you have to do it. Mm, the minute. Yeah, and it's not even a minute. It'd be like thirty seconds by the time a, the about coaches. About forty, yeah. yeah. So by the time the fighter gets back to you, you know the ten seconds, like when they say seconds out, you know, and um, and seconds out just means you know like the coach is the second. So when they say seconds out, that means okay, coach is out. Yeah, They're like it's not the actual time seconds; it's the person second. And we were just talking about this off camera about how you obviously do the UFCs and like some pretty big events, mm-hmm. and it would be for me anyway. It would be fucking impossible not to act like a fan when I see some of these guys. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it can be. It can be sometimes, but. That's the thing, like you get paid to be professional, you know. Yeah. So and if you ever if you ever look at me social media uh, or anything like that, like you'll see some photos of me at the show. But they're photographs that people have given me, you know, mm. or someone has taken like so another cut man might take a video or a photograph backstage when you're doing your work and then you, you give it to him for his social media or whatever. Yeah. But you never you don't have your phone when you're doing your job. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's just their job. Have you ever been? What was the the most like starstruck or like, oh my god, I can't believe it's this person? Well, I I was working with uh, Anderson Silva. Oh, far out! Yeah, That's and crazy. He's, yeah, and he's a, like a really really nice guy, and he, he kept calling me coach. You know, yes, coach, no coach, excuse me, coach. And uh, I was gloving them up, so I I gloved them up. And um, two minutes later, the inspector comes back and says, hey, can you come back in? Anderson has a problem. So obviously I'm 
shitting myself, going, oh, fuck, I'm after messing up here. So I walk in and I said, <laughs> I said, hey, what's up? And he goes, oh, I can't get my tracksuit off because he had his tracksuit top on oh. and he put his gloves on over it. So he says, look, just cut the arms, you know? So uh, I cut the arms off his um, tracksuit top and then we pulled it off. Yeah. And we threw it in the bin. And I remember walking away going, oh, I should have kept that. Why the fuck didn't you keep it? I just, the thing is, as I said to you, like, you're not. You're in the job, you're working. Yeah, you're not in that frame of mind yeah. at all. It's just a job. What fight was that for? Do you remember? I think it was when he fought Izzy. Oh, really? So yeah. there was recent ish. Yeah, yeah. The last decade or so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. That would have been like seven years ago now. Jesus, six. that's where I go. Yes, yeah, so I'd say about six. It was pre COVID, I reckon. Mm. That's insane. Yeah. Did you when have you when did you start doing the UFC events? It was the Adelaide show. Mark Hunt. Oh, 2018? 2019. December 2019. Oh, that was no. Who was that? Was that Mark Hunt and Steve Hay? No. No, I went to that as a fan. Yeah. Um, I can't remember. Jimmy Crute was on it. I think mm. he was the only Aussie that won that night. Have you always been a massive fan of mixed martial arts? No, or no, no. Are you no. more of a boxing I'm more of a boxing fan. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a casual when it comes to... Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A bit of a casual. Like, I couldn't tell you the flyweight champion and won, for example. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't be able to tell you who the female champion and won MMA is. Mm. Uh, you know, like I just... I Which guess is I, strange because you're such a good train. Like you're a big train. Like you're very good. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I guess that translated. That would translate over from all the boxing you've done as well. Yeah, yeah. Now I watch boxing. Like, I, like my wife is quite. Uh, <laughs> he's always giving out, you know, because I watch hours and hours and hours of boxing. Do you feel like the sport's a bit compromised? What boxing? Yeah. Uh, it's in a great spot at the moment. Well, though. boxing's always been compromised since I was eight years old. Mm. Like people are like, oh my god, I can't believe that happened. And I look at them, go, I believe that, like, it's the, like it's a dirty sport. I've seen some fucking heinous decisions and shit. Not even boxing. decisions, but how people act and how people think. And don't think for one second that it's not, like it's only boxing. You know, it's across the board. Mm. There is some. There's some. There's whenever you get combat sports or any sports in general, but I think mostly combat sports. There's always something going. Yeah, on. and the thing about combat sports is you have to love it. Yeah. Because if you don't love it, um, you won't watch it. Like you'll, mm. you'll because there'll be something that will just tip you over the edge and say, "Oh, I can't believe this is happening," and and you just watch something else. What did you think about Fury and Usyk? Did you watch it? Oh, I loved it. Yeah, did stayed you? up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But did you? I didn't watch it, so I wasn't able to watch it. But I watched some highlights, mm. and I heard a lot of people saying that it was a pretty fair decision. Then I had some people say Tyson probably edged it over. Yeah, but you see, there's another thing. Like we're getting into, we're getting into murky waters because you start talking to people like, see me, I'm a casual in MMA. Right? Mm. I've got no business telling anybody if a decision is a robbery or not. Mm. It, do, got, it doesn't no translate business. over as but, much but, as people but think. Not, eh? But not even that. Like you, you think you know more than you actually know. Mm. You don't know shit. Mm. You know, and it's just you're just jumping on the bandwagon. Then you know it's just. And again, I don't want to be talking for people. I don't know. I don't know who's saying it's a robbery. It's not a robbery. It was close. It wasn't close. Looked like a great fight, though. It was an amazing fight. I loved it. It was great. And it could have went either way. But I just think Usyk, me personally, I just think Usyk did more and I thought he won the fight. I always love tuning in to either Lomachenko or Canelo. Yeah. They're my two favourite fighters to watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. Lomachenko, when he's on, is just one of the most aesthetically pleasing fighters you'll yeah. ever watch. He's yeah. a, He's just so fun. Yeah, he, and it, he and, bashed. Yeah. Was it Gambos as he fought recently? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, he yeah. put on a clinic, so good. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, look, you're looking at all time greats, and it, like, we're lucky to have these kind of people to watch. Canelo might be one of the best boxers of all time. He's like a top ten boxer in my yeah. opinion of all yeah. time. Yeah, and that's the thing about the sport. Like we, we, uh, it's almost like we're protective as fans. Mm. Right, and I used to be like this myself when I was younger. When I was, you know, egotistical, and well, I guess I still am a little bit. But you know, I've been, I did a lot of work around the ego and that. But I would say, now, who are you coming into my sport? 
part. Mm. You're not allowed to be a fan of Triple G. Just gatekeeping. You know what I mean? You yeah. can't be a fan of Triple G. I've been following him since he was an amateur. How dare you come along now just because he's a world champion? Mm. You know? That's it's a weird thing with combat sports because everyone's like that with combat sports. Everybody at some point. is like that, right? And what we should be doing is we should be saying to people, not how dare you. You should be saying, you like Triple G, you should check out Marvin Hagler. Mm. You know what I mean? Marvelous you Marvin Hagler. 100%. Oh, you like Marvin Hagler? Well, how about you try some guys in the lighter weights, you know? You know, and you just, and you just, you say to them, you try and get them into boxing. Marvin Hagler's still alive, isn't he? I think he is, And he's yeah. healthy, because he retired really healthy, and he moved to, like, fucking Italy. Italy, and yeah, yeah. Doing he, he, he like, started doing yeah. movies and stuff, yeah, yeah. yeah. But there, and again, like... I oh, see, I don't know much about the boxing, yeah. but I know enough about it to, to yeah. watch it and appreciate it. Yeah, and that result, like, like that result between him and, uh, and Leonard, like, that still goes down as, like, the greatest robbery of all time. And you're like, <laughs> bro, it's... It wasn't a robbery. It's just that the fans are divided. Yeah, you know, and that's why. Yeah. And that's why I'm a coach and I'm not a judge, because it's the worst job. It's the most thankless job judging, isn't it? But I'm also biased. Like, yeah, I, yeah. Like I'm going to favor the guy that punches more. And not only am I going to favor the guy that punches more, I like guys that go forward. Yeah, going forward, and I feel I really feel like you should just score on damage. Well, you can't. But you can't. I know because no. it's because at the end of the day, it's a, sport. it's a sport. It's not a. It's not a. Um, Do you know what I mean? It's not like, a blood fest. Well, if you think about it, right? In golf, should we just score on the ball going in the hole? Mm. No, you have to score on how many shots it, it takes. takes it to put it in there. Yeah, it's the same in combat sports. You know, if I'm doing well, if I'm making you miss. If I'm managing to position you where into spots that you don't want to be in. See, I don't know how much they score defense as well. They do score it. Do they score it heavily? Yeah. yeah. Like it's it's the whole thing. Like mm. these judges aren't just and I know you may think this, but they're not just plucked off the street. Mm. Like now there are some judges that should not be judging. It that's a fact. Yeah, there's right? there's a few And especially in the box and the and here was the thing about MMA. In the early days, uh, the commission, especially in America, the commission would give you your judges. So I you think they still do that, do they? Yeah, the the Nevada State Athletic Commission and stuff. That, but they're all. But the thing with well, the wor worst thing about MMA is MMA judging is a lot of them are boxing. Boxing, boxing yeah. Well, most of them, well, I would say ninety five percent of them are strict. Oh, they're boxing judges. Well, that doesn't happen outside of America. Mm. So oh, yeah. it doesn't happen. So the judges that I see in like when because I work Asia Pacific and Australia, yeah. and the judges like when they turn up to the hotel, they all go, they have a role, they're all high level jujitsu guys. That's good. You know what I mean? Because ju the jujitsu thing is really important. Uh -huh. they're but all, yeah, because it can look like someone's in a bad position when mm -hmm. they're not, and they're like winning the position. Mm -hmm. If someone's good off their back. Mm -hmm. And the other person's in their guard, and they're throwing up arm bars from the bottom. They should be scored as they're attacking, not. But to an untrained judge, it'll look like they're getting overwhelmed with pressure, but they're not. But not even that. Now I like the way you use the words, you know, untrained, right? Mm. So you're a big fan of MMA. You know all the people. You you obviously believe you can watch a fight and score a fight. Yet you're biased towards damage. Yeah, hundred percent. But you shouldn't be. Because yeah. that's not what wins the fight. Yeah. So these guys, they do courses. They talk to each other all the time. You know, they, they're they really, really good at what scores. And that's what they're there for. Mm. Like, the fighters fight to win. We're there to be entertained. And the judges are there to make sure that the sport, not the fighter, that the sport is judicated correctly. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, oh, look at that guy. He's got, like, how many times have you seen a press conference and you read the comments underneath? Oh. I can't believe he lost that fight. Look at the state of his face. Oh, I'd f and like, that's got nothing to do yeah. with the fight, bro. And I know, you know, oh, well, it should be. And yeah, probably, but that's not how it's going. Like you said, it's a sport. You have to you have to implement some sort of sporting element or it's just two dudes in a cage 100%. trying to fucking kill each other. Yeah, but then you get me at 25 years old. Like, I'm 50 now, right? But you get me at 25 years old. I'm a meathead where, you know, opinions coming out my arse and an ego the size of this room. And I'm going to tell you 
he got robbed because mm. X, Y, and Z. And you better listen to me because I know. I don't know shit. I don't know shit. And it's like, you know, like when refs get done for like early stoppages. You're, that's, see, that's a really hard one. Well, here's the thing, yeah. right? And the thing, right, we watch the TV, we look at the fights, and we remove our empathy mm. and our compassion because it's so you like, got money on it, you got a beer yeah, in you. And that referee is an asshole. And I'm not, look, I'm not here protecting these people. I'm just trying to educate the fan base. Mm. You know, like it's the um, the referee is in there. He sees and hears the effect of those punches. We don't. Yeah. Like you want to hear some of those shots going in. He sees the opponent's eyes roll up in the back of his head mm. and he jumps in and stops it. And then the guy jumps up and he goes, what are you doing? He says, bro, I seen the eyes roll up in the back. I don't care. You don't want them to take the extra two f- well, to three well, shots. That, look, look, listen, that's what they're paid for. Yeah. Like there is a part of this game where you have to detach yourself from it, mm. especially as a cut man, you know, and a coach, because you're sending someone in there that you love and you know how durable they are. You know, they get dropped and your heart is like, God, take him out, take him out. Like cornering Justin Gaethje would be the most fucking stressful experience bro. of your life. Bro. <laughs> Trevor Whitman would have a fucking heart attack 100%. every time he's in that yeah, corner. Yeah, yeah, But they have, to, they, they have this unwritten bond yeah. that, that people don't understand. And do you yeah. know what? Referees and shit, they have bad days in the office too. Yeah. Just like I have bad days at work and I fuck up. I'm sure you have bad days at work even though you're good at what you do. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just a human error thing. Some days the referee might pull the trigger too early or too late. It's better to pull it too early than... Uh, like when Bobby Green... Uh, I can't remember when it was, two fights ago. Not his last fight with Jim Miller, but his fight before that. I think it was with Jalen Turner. He took four too many shots after he got knocked. He was knocked straight out and he took four shots and they they probably took two fights of his career. Mm. Yeah, 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 but look, it's... But it's just human error. But it's not even that. Like, it's at the end of the day, it's still a fight, right? Yeah, you're going to get hurt. Yeah, and it's, you know, you're, you're wrong if you're too early, you're wrong if you're too late. Mm. And sometimes you're wrong when you're on time. Mm. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it's like it's and it's a thankless job and I wouldn't do it. Like I just I just wouldn't do it because I don't have the capacity. I don't have the skill to do. I don't have the uh what's the word I'm looking for? I don't have the uh the temperament for it, I don't think. For know? for refing or judging. Mm. Oh, you judging know? would be terrible, I feel, because I feel like you, it would take the joy out of a fight for me because mm-hmm. you the best thing about a good fight is you're just so invested in it. Mm-hmm. Whereas I feel like if you're judging it, you a judge would look at a fight very differently to how I look at a fight. Well, they're not looking at the fight. They're looking at who's scoring. Yeah, they're looking. They're scoring the fight. They're scoring. There, the fight. And I feel like that would take out the... Because I'm such a fan, I feel like that would take out the joy for me. Yeah, and then here's the thing. like You can't be a fan as well when you're working, like you said. 100%. The guy you like comes in and now you're biased. Mm. So, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one, you know. And look... Again, here I am talking about judging and refing when I have no right to be because I'm, I've never done a course. I don't know the full scoring criteria. Like if you were to sit down with Mark Goddard right now and he was to say to you, right, Sab, you watch loads of fights. You've got an opinion on whether something's a robbery or not. Tell me how you score a fight. Mm. What's the tree? I wouldn't actually be able to you give you the criteria. A, you wouldn't even be able to tell him what the number one scoring criteria is. Is it damage? No. No, it has to be something around clean, effective striking, ring generalmanship. Mm. Damage has nothing to do with the fight. That's crazy. But it's not. It's not crazy, but like to me, I would say the so first say, thing I would so say. So let's say, for example, you cut weight, right, to make weight, and you're dehydrated. So you don't rehydrate too well. Mm. So your skin's a little thin. Yeah? You hit me, and I'm, let's say I'm a, a Mexican, I've got thick skin, I'm well hydrated. And you hit me with 14 clean punches, right? In an exchange or whatever, or in the round. And the two punches I land on you... Because you've got scar tissue, your skin And the thin. two punches I land on you opens up a cut above your left mm. eye and on your right cheek. So I win the round, right? Yeah, exactly. You have a very good point. Are you telling me I win the round? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point. It's a 14 clean strike oh, absolutely. Yeah, every day. But it, but it has to be. Yeah. It has to be, mm. you know? 
Like, right. faces don't tell the story of a fire. No, absolutely not. always. Not. Yeah. And if, and if that was the case, then people would just calf kick. Yeah. Well, well, I, fuck. well I, I win because he can't walk. Yeah. You're like, bro, he's taking you down 20 times. He's hit you with, like, every punch he's thrown. And he's landed four head kicks. Do Mexicans actually have thicker skin? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you'd fucking know more yeah. than me about people's yeah, yeah, skin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you, is it, what was the worst cut you've had to work on where you're like oh. I don't know if I can do this uh, I, it wasn't so much the worst cut but it was the, a technical cut right and it was um, Brad Riddell and it was uh, it was his first fight and he was fighting Jamie Malarkey I think Brad Riddell fight Malarkey for his, um, his first fight both of them were having their first fight oh wow yeah both of them were having their first fight and it was the last exchange in the first round and Malarkey landed a left hook and I cut him above the left eye, I think it was. And um, <clears throat> so imagine, like, imagine I was sitting outside the cage and I'm going, oh yeah, no one's cut here, so I don't need anything. And then all of a sudden, the very last punch that gets thrown is his thing. So what we do is we prepare. So when we sit down to get ready for a fight, we prepare as if the guy is already cut. Yeah. For these, for this exact scenario, so we go in and I see the cut go over, and, he, and it just had started to bleed because it was literally the last punch. And he sits down on the thing, and, he, and I'm like, "Oh yeah, okay." <laughs> and he turns to me, I look at it, and it's like his whole eyelid just kind of flopped out. Oh shit! And I'm looking at the bone, like I'm going, "Holy shit, that's deep!" I'm like that's deep, and yeah. Uh, so yeah, and he looks at me and he goes, is it bad? And I, what did I say to him? I said, uh, I think, yeah, I said something like, uh, ah, don't worry about it, I've cut myself worse shaving. That's what I said. <laughs> his eyebrows fucking hanging off. <laughs> yeah, well, it wasn't his eyebrows. Yeah, it was, it was pretty high up here. It was pretty bad, actually. It was pretty bad. And, uh, but I stopped the cut. I stopped the cut and uh, I worked on it. I had another two rounds to work on it. And he went on to win the fight. So he won his fight. That could have been stopped. And it was his yeah. first fight. You know, and I and he went on to win the bonus for fight of the night. So yeah, a, a good cut man. What people don't understand about like cut men and people managing bruises and swelling and shit. A lot of the reasons a lot of fights don't stop is because you got a good cut man in the corner. Yeah, and that's a good cut man makes a huge difference. And you should be like a good referee. How do you know a referee's done a good job? Because you don't see him. Yeah, you don't know they're there. You don't know they're there, mm. right? And. Big John McCarthy was probably one of the best examples of it. He was so slick and so, like, out of the way all the time. You rarely, like... Yeah, but are you looking back with rose-tinted glasses? You maybe. Yeah. I might just be romanticising it. you know what it. I mean? Great referee, a pioneer, you know, but he absolutely made mistakes. There's no two ways about yeah. that, right? Same as Herb Dean. Herb Dean, one of the best in Great the game. One guy. of the best in the game. He's a, he a, he's had bad nights. Super laid back. But that's it. Like, it's... If you drive your car long enough... You're going to crash it at some stage. Mm. If you ride a motorbike long enough, you're going to fall off it at some stage. Is it harder dealing with cuts or swellings? It depends. It depends. Uh, swellings can get way out of control. Yeah, I was going to say, because if you get a really good, like, if you get a good hematoma or something in yeah, the side. Sw yeah, swelling can get way, way, way out of control, especially on the soft tissue under the eye, mm. you know, and then that can start to, to close the eye. But, um, yeah, all you can do is yeah, get your cold compress on it and try and That's what it is, is it? So the bar you the bar that you're pressing on the face, that's mm -hmm. just a cold like yeah. that's been in ice the whole time. Yeah. And you just compress it onto the And you compress bruise. it on, yeah. And you're kind of moving around the blood or No, that's that's a that's an old uh that's an old urban myth, you know. Excuse me. No, you're right. That's an old myth where, you know, you push the bruise away from the eye. Mm. Uh, all you're doing is create like this swelling here will make, will stay, and all you're doing is pushing bad stuff. So you 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 you're just making it worse. Mm. You think you're pushing it away. So you just press down. You just press down as much as you can and maintain and try and uh, lessen the swelling in that area. You don't want to push it into another area. You mm. don't want to take good skin or good. Um, good tissue and you don't want to push bad tissue into it mm. do you know what i mean yeah now if it's <clears throat> if it's under the eye you might move your compress a little bit 
to just kind of get all of it like to because it's soft here so i can't press into your eye because your eye is soft so i might want to take it and get it onto the bone and then press Fuck, that so, I, so i have something to press against mm. so you might see the end swell or the bag of ice or whatever they choose to use to pull it down and, and you want something behind it to press against mm. you know but yes we don't want to be you know the old school yeah because i used to i remember they used to like push it and i was like fuck yeah, is man. that like just moving it around it's yeah, crazy yeah yeah. yeah 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 like and don't get me wrong i've done that myself like i've it's just I, learning I, yeah yeah it's just learning yeah yeah right yeah. that would i remember the the worst swelling i've ever seen would always be Joanna's on jhx oh, yeah. fucking head yeah, yeah. that was that was in that is do you at that point you can't help her can you but here's the thing like who are we to tell her to stop oh she's a great fight best female fight of all time but you can't like you can't help her at that point surely like there's nothing you really can do besides just oh, keep it down yeah 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 and she's going back out to get hit like oh. it's not like she's going to sit on the couch and relax with a bag of ice on her but you know what I mean? She's going back out to get hit. From a high, one of the, the highest level strikers in yeah. <laughs> women's MMA. Yeah, yeah. That's bloody crazy. Mm, madness. And so have you always been at Rikers? Are you at, are you, do you just use their facilities or do you train, at, are you a trainer at Rikers or do you just train yeah, specific yeah. people? So, no, no, no. So I used to have a gym here down in Lonsdale, a club called Southside Boxing Club. Oh yeah. Years and years and years ago. And, uh, but I wasn't in the right mind to have my own business and do all that, you know. It was uh, I was too busy with other stuff, you know. So uh, about ten years ago, Kim Johnson, I I I I'd I'd stopped, I'd closed down uh, Southside Boxing Gym, I stepped away from it, and um, and then I don't know, I was about a month or two doing nothing. And Kim Johnson reached out to me. He had just lost to a fighter called Wes Kappa, who was a boxer that turned over to Muay Thai. And he reached out to me, says, look, I have a rematch against this guy. He's a really good boxer. Uh, is there any chance you could, uh, you know, help me defend against the boxer? So I went up and I met him and Jez. Jez is the owner of uh, Rikers. So I went up, spoke to Jez and Kim, and Jez just said to me, he said, look, we really like what you're doing. Is there any chance you can stick around? And, you know, because it's something to offer them, you know. I, 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 I knew my way around boxing. Uh, I could adapt it to Muay Thai. Was it hard for you to no. uh, figure out how to do that? No. See, the, people have this idea where, you know, they have this thing where it's like the difference between Muay Thai, boxing, MMA is like the difference between uh, soccer and downhill skiing. Mm. It's not. It's not. It's it's like the difference between rugby and Aussie rules mm. and rugby league. Just and slight rugby variations. It's, fighting's fighting. Do you know what I mean? Fighting is like, fighting's all about movement, accuracy, delivery. Like it doesn't matter where you are or what sport you're doing. It's can you get yourself in and out positions to deliver shots and then exit those positions without being hit. Like that's what it is. Whether you're using, whether you're in a gun fight, whether you're in a knife fight, whether you're in a boxing match, Muay Thai, kickboxing, or MMA, it's the same thing. Can I get into a position to hit that guy or girl, and then exit without getting hit? That's basically it. Mm. You know. So the footwork stances, like people say, oh yeah, the Muay Thai stance is different to the boxing stance. Well, it's not if you're six foot six. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Your stance is your stance. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. You know what I mean? Your stance is your stance. Yeah. Okay, in Muay Thai, you should, you know, maybe have a little bit less weight on the front foot so you can check quick. Mm. And well, you're probably more square on. Oh, but it depends, right? It depends on the fighter. There's so many different styles Absolutely. now. Absolutely. But there's so many different styles because people have their own personalities, you know? So we have a thing. Mm. That there's a thing called, it's, well, it's not a thing, I guess. It's, it's like a performance uh, triangle right and in the performance triangle so if you want to be an elite athlete right we we say you kind of have to have these three things right so these three things are discipline learning 
and creativity. Mm. So in order to be an elite athlete, you need to have the discipline to turn up, not the motivation, because anyone can be motivated, right? I'm motivated every night when I set my alarm on my phone to get up out of bed at six o'clock to do a bit of training. I don't have the discipline to get out of bed. Mm. <laughs> do you know very, what I'm I have the motivation to do things, I but it's the, you need the discipline to execute them. Correct, right? So we need the discipline. Then you need learning. How coachable are you? Are you smart? Can you retain information? Like, can you execute what you've been taught? And then C, creativity. Get creative with it. Mm. Learn the basics and then start being creative. I think the perfect example of that is Maddie Stevens. Yeah. He's fucking got all three of them. He's creative. He, he's one of the most fun strikers to watch mm -hmm. you'll ever watch. Yeah. He's so fun. Yeah. But all athletes are, like all elite athletes mm. are like that. You know? So you'll have guys who are super disciplined, you know, but they can't, you th they can't retain anything you're teaching them. Yeah. You know? When you have all those three elements, that's when you reach that level. Yeah. You need all three. You can't have two of them. You can't have one of them. You need Correct. all three. And you need to be creative, right? Because mm. we say, okay, Keep your hands up, move your head, move your feet, get in and out, all that kind of stuff. But when you get in there, it never happens. But, but yeah, but, but when you get in there, it's on you. Yeah, you got to, and you got to make shit up on the fly because oh. at the end of the day, you're in a fight. Like um, one yeah. punch, and what's making <laughs> shit changes up? it? Yeah, it's being creative, right? Yeah, and we're, and we're like, here's the thing: like we we look at creativity, and we're like, oh yeah, I'm not really artistic. I don't have a creative bone in my body. You're like, bro, you're waking up in the morning and you're making decisions all the time. Mm. You're constantly making decisions. Will I have a tea? Will I have a coffee? Will I have a sugar? Won't I have a sugar? Uh, what route will I take to work? What radio station will I listen to? Will I listen to a podcast? What podcast will I listen to? You're constantly making decisions. You're being creative. Mm. You know, I just, as a coach, I try to encourage people to be creative. You know, and, and also help them to learn. You know, it's not rocket, it's not rocket science. You know, and you know, I would never like I don't want to, like I would never talk ill of a coach or of anyone else. But there's a lot of people out there that will try and uh, complicate something to make themselves look better. Mm. You know, so if someone comes to me to learn to box, <clears throat> for example, let's say it's a high level football or or whatever, and I've had really high level Aussie rule players come in their off season. For fitness. I uh, to learn to box. Mm. Not for fitness, just something new, the cross train maybe. Yeah. And um no photos, no anything, no social media. Just come in, do a bit of work. And I teach them the basics. And they will throw a thousand jabs and a thousand right hands. And I don't care if they get bored. Mm. I don't care if they come in and they're like, well, I was watching Instagram and this guy is throwing a twenty six punch combination. He's moving to say he's doing all that. And I said, well, off you go then, buddy. Go and talk to him. Because you asked me to teach you out the box. That's what you asked me to do. Your pad work is very simple. But yeah. like, it's very clean and mm -hmm. effective. You don't, like whenever you post, um, whenever Jack posts like videos of you doing pads or Maddie, mm -hmm. it's always like three to four punch combo, just rep repetitions of it, repetitions mm -hmm. of it until it's perfect. 100%. And it's like, did you see those cool things on Instagram where those people like Floyd Mayweather throwing a fucking 74 hit combo and like he's memorized it? It's cool aesthetically, but it's it's probably it's aesthetically pleasing. It's but what not he never shows is his real work. The 2,000 jabs he throws on the bag and the heavy bag. Mm -hmm. He is phenomenal to watch on the heavy bag. Oh, yeah. yeah he yeah, is yeah. one of... But people don't see that side of him. Oh, you, he's you have phenomenal. To, you have to dig deep to see him on the heavy bag you have to go on a search <clears throat> like he's just pit, like pit pat pit, like he's just for 20 minutes he just doesn't stop hitting it and he's yeah. so clean with everything he's just there's phenomenal a, there's a there's a video out there of him trying to like a jab yeah I've, I, I believe I've, I've seen it and he's hitting it really hard and really fast you know And but there's like there's other there's a video out there of Paul Imaginali hitting the, the heavy bag and he's like <laughs> Like he's known in the game for being light-handed. And he's hitting the bag. 
And you're like, geez, if he was to hit a normal human being. Oh, he'd kill him. They'll have Flo- Floyd alleg- allegedly has pillow hands. If he jabbed me, I'd fucking get knocked out because it'd yeah. be so clean and so quick. Yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd just get knocked out. The people they're punching are the toughest people in the world. Like, it's, it's hard to put these people away. Yeah, and I, I guess, like, <coughs> I guess the, the best scenario or the best example you can give is in MMA would be like, you know, George St. Pierre, like as he's coming through the ranks, he's murdering everybody. And then when he gets to the top, the guy he's fighting is murdering everybody to get there. Mm. And then when they have their fight, it's a five decision. Mm. It's a five round decision. And you're like, hang on a second. I, I thought you two were knocking everybody out. I says, yeah, but now they're facing the best. Yeah. And you're like, when you're coming up, and you'd be surprised how, you'd be surprised at what level, uh, at how high a level, people are still, you know, not fit enough, not technical enough, not defensive enough, you know? And the problem with that is, is that you win your state title because you're a little bit fitter than the guy that you beat. Mm. And then you get to national level, and you beat him because you hit harder than him. And then you go to world level. Now all of a sudden, they're as fit as you, they hit as hard as you, and they're technically better than you. Mm. And they have really good punch resistance. So they're like, oh, hang on. But your whole career leading up to that, you never saw yourself on the world stage. So you were just happy enough with being fit and hitting hard. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So I think as a coach... You should be thinking to yourself, okay, and I, I'm not, this is going to sound like really egotistical and big-headed or whatever, but you should be thinking to yourself as a coach, you know, okay, the top Japanese dudes in K1, how would he go against them? How would this guy fare? You know, this is a kid that's had five fights in your gym. He's still an amateur. How would he go his first five fights in the UFC? Like, how technically sound is he? How defensively sound is he? Don't be thinking, oh, he needs to learn this for his next fight. Teach him. Mm. Teach him the entire game. The goal is to get him to where you Because the go. game is excelling so much that being tough is not good enough anymore. Being tough is... You need it, to be an athlete now but being as well. T- being tough is a requirement. It's a requirement. Yeah. But like, I feel like obviously in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was a lot more less technical, more just really tough, tough dudes that would get far on their chin and they hit really hard, not much cardio, you know, like just... But, but, but not in other combat sports. Yeah, not in Mu- true. Not in Muay Thai, yeah. not in boxing, not in kickboxing. Muay Thai is such a, such a fun sport. So technical. It's beautiful, mate. It's beautiful. And it's crazy that it's never caught on huge in the West. I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm surprised boxing is still going, to be honest with you. You know, I'm surprised mm. it's still a thing. You know, it's just hard cars that love it. And then every now and then you'll get a crossover guy like Anthony Joshua or Canelo, as you said. Mm. You know, like even Tyson Fury is a polarizing character and all that He's kind of stuff. He's hilarious as well. You know, but look look at Usyk, right? Like he's not a crossover guy. No, no, like, I guarantee you know, no one would, or not, if you're not in the combat sports world and he walked past, you would know the fuck 100%. he is. 100%. Like, if you were at Adelaide Airport and Canelo walked past... I'd freak out. Right? Yeah. But you would. A lot of people wouldn't, probably, no. eh? My missus wouldn't know who he is. Jesus. My kids wouldn't know who That's, he is. That baffles me. Yeah, absolutely. So we are, we are massive fans of minority sports. I think Conor McGregor's probably the biggest I thing was, in combat I, sports. I was just about to say that. Now, if Conor McGregor walked past... People would look and say, oh, there's Conor McGregor. Yeah, Ronda Rousey, yeah. they'd know who. Mike Tyson. 100%. Uh, I, even, like, even guys like, like super famous to Like us. John Jones probably yeah. would not know. Now that you've said it, like it is a very niche world we live in. And, but we love it and we expect everyone to understand it. Yeah, they don't. But here's the thing. <laughs> yeah. When people want to come into our space... Our casuals, shut up. It's a, I've been yeah. watching this game for 20 years. It's so Who are you true. giving up when you're out? You're like, hang on, do you want the sport to grow? It's not an easy not? sport to approach as a new person. No, and it should be. Yeah. You know, it should be. 
And you, so you have a pretty solid list of fighters at Rikers. You have phenomenal strike. Obviously, the striking there's phenomenal. Like you got Matty Stevens. Jack switches up between Rikers and M16, mm-hmm. and he had a phenomenal win on the mm-hmm. last weekend, mm-hmm. I believe. Do you, do you, so you train, you got so much on your plate. So you got the podcast. We didn't even talk that you got a huge po- podcast platform. Mm-hmm. You and your wife. Mm. And so where do you find time to do all this shit? <laughs> well, we're full time, so. Because you're doing that, you're training people, you're doing the cut man and stuff, and now mm-hmm. you got um complete fighter care, mm-hmm. which we'll get on to as well, mm-hmm. which is your, when did you start that? That was uh, recent? About four weeks ago. Four weeks ago. Yeah, about four weeks ago. And that's going to be you teaching people or doing holding like seminar style events, yeah, or, or workshops. Workshops. You know? So um, when I was in the military, there was a thing where you had your training, right? And training was learning stuff and getting fit and becoming competent and things. Mm. But then you had another thing which we would call the transfer of knowledge, right? Or a transfer of experience or an experience workshop, where a guy who was was in combat and something happened in that combat. And he would come back and we'd sit down and we would talk about what happened. So he's teaching you from experience. This is what happened. Look out for this when you're out there. Right? And that wasn't referred to as a training block. That was referred to as a transfer of experience or a mm. transfer of knowledge. And basically with this... Uh, complete fight or care it's not you're not going to get a certificate to say you're now qualified to be a court man it's just I've done this for 15 years I've done it at a professional level for 10 years and I've done it at an elite level for 5 years like world level and I'm willing to transfer my knowledge to you so what i've learned in 15 years all the mistakes i made all the bloopers i've done you know uh, i'm willing to share my experience with you so you don't have to do that you know Mm. and i'm quite sure there's there's probably people out there that are like why the hell would you do that you know keep those secrets to yourself well there's a there's a saying you know like you know be the change that you want to see in people, right? So I have two options. I can keep going to small shows, walking out the back, and looking at guys, wrapping hands and going, that's fucking shit. Or I can then say, well, I'm running a workshop. Would you like to come and learn? And if they say no, then it's on them. But if they say, yeah, cool. Mm. You know? And I'm not there to teach you new things. I'm not there to say what you're doing is wrong. I'm there to say what you're doing is good. Maybe if you do this bit on top of it, it gets better. Mm. It's just a transfer of knowledge. It's not me saying I'm the number one dude and you have to do it my way. There's people being stopped in cuts since Joe Lewis was fighting. You know, 50 cents pieces in ice, sticking it on their eye. (laughs) Oh, that's insane. They used to chew tobacco and stick it in the cut. Way, way, way back in the day, you know? So I, and, and I see some cut men still use spoons. Spoons yeah, for yeah. swelling. Yeah, for swelling. Like there's still guys out there doing all that kind of stuff. So this like I'm not I'm not I haven't just swanned in here and saying, hey guys, I've reinvented everything. I haven't reinvented anything. And the stuff that I'm showing you has been shown to me. Mm. Like I didn't sit down and design all this. This is stuff that's being done. This is how it is. Yeah. And again, discipline, learning, creativity. Have the discipline to go out there and practice your craft. Have the head on your shoulders where you're willing to learn something. Whether you use it or not, it's up to you. And get creative with it. Mm. As long as the hand is protected and as long as the cut doesn't bleed you're doing your job right so that's it you know so the the thing with complete fighter care is just you know a knowledge transfer so i've done a job already 
did it for Element Fight Night. Um, it was North versus South. And the promoter, who's also a coach, said, look, you know, complete control, MMA. They have nine people on or whatever. And Element Fight Night had something like 12 or 13 people on. Mm. So they were saying, right, listen, we don't have the capacity to wrap everybody and walk their cuts. Could you train two people from complete control and two people from element to wrap hands so the coaches don't have to? Now, the coaches can if they want. That's their prerogative. So over the course of four weeks, we did two hours every Saturday. And uh, I trained people from each gym. And then on the night, we wrapped everyone's hands. And I think the coach from Element Barossa, he decided to uh, to wrap his own guy's hands, which is great. It's no problem. Like We just give him the materials. Off you go. If he wants help, he can have it. We're here to help. Uh, but he did a great job. Like He's good at wrapping hands. Like, But it's not a question of how good you are at wrapping hands. It's, if you're wrapping hands, who's warming up your fighter? Mm. If you're wrapping hands, you know... That means then if I have, let's say I have six fighters, it means they all have to come at the same time. Even if one guy is on late, yeah, he still has to turn up to get his hands wrapped, right? How long does it take you to wrap hands? Me personally? Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty quick. Yeah. Oh, you're, you've done it. Like someone knew though, what would you say about? Yeah, you, you, you want to keep, you want to keep your wrap per hand under 10 minutes. I was going to say about 10 minutes sounds about. Now that's conservative. You really, really want to be under seven or six. And you can do it in like, say, five? Yeah, like pretty quick. But it depends on the fighter. Sometimes you want to talk, as a coach, you want to talk to your fighter. You might go through the game plan again. You know, you might do this, you might do that. So there's a lot going on. There could be a camera stuck in your face. Like there's so much that goes on. But like a small, no, a small show out the back, you know. But also, as a coach, you want to be getting the practice in, right? Mm. So it's like a, it's like a double-edged sword. You know, okay, I want to practice wrapping all these hands. So if I do six sets of hands, I'm getting good practice, right? Mm. Absolutely. But then what's what, what what's the cost that comes at? You know, that means all your fighters get there early, which is okay. It's only a small show. And, you know, they get their hands wrapped and then they're sitting around because the coach is wrapping hands. But, you know, if the coach then has his own pad holder, he has his own, there's other coaches... That means there's other coaches to wrap people up. But how many times have you gone to a show where, you know, the promoter says, right, two coaches, and that's it. Mm. And now you're stuck. Well, hang on. Like, we're a professional team. You know, we've got a hand wrapper. We've got a cut man. We've got a boxing coach. We've got a pad man. We've got a grappling person. Like, you know, this is the level we're at. Because as I said to you earlier on, like, we're not looking at, you know, the state level. We're giving everybody the best chance to be the best version of them because we're thinking five or six years ahead. Like Jeremy, the owner of uh, Rikers, like he's, I, I, I've never worked with anyone like him before. Like never. I don't believe I've met him. Hey, Jesus, like people come up to me all the time and they're like, oh yeah, you're great at this and you're great at that. And I'm like, mate, I'm like 50% on a good day compared to him. Mm. Like... It's a brilliant mind for the sport. Um, like, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Like, you walk into a room, an amateur fight night, you walk in, and he probably knows the fighters better than the matchmakers. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Just engrossed in the sport. I can't remember Maddie's last opponent's name. Mm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know? Jez will tell you what he did in the second round. Yeah. In the second minute. I'm like, nah. <laughs> I need to watch that back. Yeah. You know, I got ADHD or whatever, you know. Do you do a lot of um, fight lights to say for Maddie's next opponent? Do you do a lot of film watching? No. No? No, 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 no. So we'll, we'll, we'll all watch film, right? So we'll all watch film individually. We don't sit down together. Yeah. And then we come back and we chat because, look, remember, we've been in the game a very, very long time. We talk the language. We know how each other thinks, you know? And uh, so we don't need to sit down together and watch something yeah you know and we're all like again you know very like we respect each other's opinions well not opinions so i hate that word opinion you know i have an opinion on something you either know it or you don't Mm. you either believe in it or you don't that's it 
You know, well, in my opinion, well, what you're saying is, is that you know absolutely nothing about the subject, but you're going to say something anyway. Mm. That's all that means, in my opinion. Have the courage to say, I believe this, and I'm willing to put myself forward saying I believe this. Yeah. Or you can say, I don't fucking know. <laughs> or just say, I but don't that's, know. And I was yeah. just about to go there. Or say, I absolutely know this. Yeah. Or I don't know it. Yeah. Because yeah. we're dealing with real scenarios. Matty is going to go to China and he's going to fight a killer from Thailand. I can't say, well, in my yeah. opinion, this guy likes this. It needs to be no, definite. It needs to be definite. And you need to be transparent. If you don't know something, you need oh. to say you don't know it. Because it's they're not they're not playing a a game or 100%. a ball sport. This is yes. shin on shin, shin on fucking head stuff. Yeah. Now, if I only practice that every time someone fights, it means I'm only practicing that 10 times a year. Mm. So I need to practice that in my life, right? I can't have an opinion on things. Mm. You know, <clears throat> my daughter comes home from school, there's something going on, and my son, there's something going on with him. I can't say, well, listen, son, in my opinion, I think you, no, no. <laughs> You know, this is what I think you should do in this situation, son. Mm. You know, I, to my daughter, look, I truly believe this is what you should do. Or this, this is what I done and it was the wrong thing to do. You know, I believe that you shouldn't do that. So you're practicing not having an opinion on anything. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because opinions are like arseholes. Everybody has one and some are bigger than others. <laughs> and that's it. You know, so... I've, and I've only been, I've only come to this realization about seven years ago. You know, like I've just stopped being opinionated because I was an opinionated asshole. Mm. Because that's the great thing about opinions, right? You don't need to know anything to have one. Yeah. You know? It's very true. I talk so much, <laughs> especially on the podcast after we've had a few drinks. Mm hmm. I'll comment on shit I have no place commenting yeah. on. Yeah. And I'll say it with such confidence. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I've just, I, I've stopped doing that, you know. I'm after losing my train of thought. <laughs> oh, yeah. But yeah, we were talking about, you know, like, do we watch film? Do we all that kind of stuff? So you have to be really deliberate. And when you're watching film, when you're watching somebody, you can fall into the trap of watching the mistakes they make. But not watching what they're good at. You know, well, here's the thing, like, you watch the mistakes they make. Every person makes a mistake. Mm. You can't rely on them making a mistake. So you don't look at their mistakes. Because they might have fixed that mistake. Well, it's not. It's a well. mistake. Mm. They did it by accident. That's what makes a mistake a mistake. So you look for their habits. Habit. I was just going to say, you're more looking for their patterns and their habits. Their habits, you know, and their personality. You know, this guy loves to come forward. What happens when, you, when he gets hit? Well, he puts his foot on the gas. He goes for the kill. What happens when he hits you? He likes to go for the kill, you mm. know? Does he like to renegotiate? So he goes into an exchange. What's he like? Does he come out of the exchange and move and, tr and try and... When I say renegotiate, as in negotiate the, negotiate the position, mm. you know? What's he trying to figure out in his head? Does he have a brain? You know, does he just like to come forward and swing? Is he? Is it more stressful um, sending a fighter into someone? You obviously, it would be more stressful when they don't have a pattern and they're just fucking chaos. Everyone has a pattern. Yeah. Even chaos is a pattern, yeah. right? You know? But the biggest thing that you would be more afraid of is my biggest fear as a coach, right? Excuse me. Do you want a water? No, no, no. I'm fine. You good? My biggest thing as a coach is, uh, and it, like I, I, this stuff keeps me up at night, you know, is that let's say the, uh, and I've seen this on TV, like I've seen this happen on TV. Let's say you get, you know, you get hit with a good solid right hand and your, <laughs> your, your guy comes back to you. You go, now listen, I need you to circle to your right away from their right hand. And your boxer looks at you and goes, I don't know how to do that. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I want you to move your feet more. Faint, come back two steps, and when he fills the gap, launch your attack. I don't know how to do that. Do you understand? Yeah. That's my biggest fear. And whether you... They're not, you, haven't, you feel like you haven't prepared them enough. And you will get away with all of that. Mm. 
you will get away with it all, all the way through your career until the one time you don't. Mm. You know, and that was the thing with Tyson Fury. His whole career, he got away with stuff. Weight bullying and... Do you know what I mean? But when he... Well, not weight bullying. He's using his he's weight. Just a, he's yeah, just a, he's not He's not bullying. He was just yeah. born with it. But he's, you know what I mean? and he it's a very mass big advantage. He leans on you. He moves well for his size. Mm. He can bamboozle you. Uh, he can affect your mental state with the way he talks. Just the reach would he's, be yeah, insane He's got to an do excellent with. job. He hits harder than he looks. And he's gotten away with it his whole career. His whole career. Until the one time he didn't. Mm. And when was that one? So he can tell everybody... Of being an Irish champion, of being a British champion, of being a European champion, of being a unified world champion, I beat Deontay Wilder, you know, like I beat Klitschko. And they're amazing accolades, but none of that matters. It doesn't matter. You're only as good as your last when, fight. When you're fighting your next fight, mm. you know? And he came unstuck because, but, but then you say to yourself, okay, well, what could he have done better? Right. Well, he could have better people around him, maybe. You know, maybe it's an outside the ring thing. I feel like his all of his demons are outside the ring issues. But, but here we are. Like here we are. That's in my opinion. <laughs> so, yeah. so here yeah. we are. We've now arrived at we should shut up now. Yeah. <laughs> right. But then you have people saying, "Well, hang on. You're in the game a long time. Like you must have some kind of an opinion, like an expert opinion." I don't know if there's such a thing as an expert opinion because it's an opinion. You never know what happens behind closed doors. 100%. Mm. So I can say, right, I believe that if he had one person talking in the corner, just the one, if he... Is he still like Cronk? Is it Cronk, Jim? Yeah, but he also has Andy Lee in his corner. A f phenomenal, phenomenal uh, boxing boxer in his time, an Irishman. And he has uh, Emmanuel Stewart's uh, nephew in the corner. But he also had his dad in there screaming and all that kind of stuff. And you don't, you, when you look at someone's corner, you're thinking to yourself, if that's what the corner's like, I wonder what the training camp was like. Chaotic. Chaotic. Mm. And you're saying to yourself, well, it's always being chaotic. It's always being crazy. So don't change anything that, that, that's, always, that's worked for me till now. You know? But then you face a guy like Usyk, you may never be him. Mm. No matter what you do, you may never beat him. You know, but are you giving yourself the best opportunity? Like, have you done I'm it interested all to see how the rematch goes. If there is one. They didn't have a rematch clause? They do have a rematch clause, but all you got to do is it's not. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to make boxers fight sometimes. Boxing is a brutal, <laughs> brutal sport. That's and, and, the and reason that, I, that I, I can't fall in love with boxing because the best, it's very rare you get the best fighting the best in their primes. Well, it's almost impossible to get them to fight. Because they're different promotions. And so I'll give you an example, right? Dana White goes, right, I want, I want George St. Pierre to fight Nick Diaz. Right? He picks up the phone. Actually, he puts it on a whiteboard. That fight's made. Mm. He's decided that fight's made. That's it. That's why it's so good. Right? Yeah. He makes the phone call, he does all this. Right? And then... So in boxing, you ring Anthony Joshua. You say, Anthony, do you want to fight Tyson Fury? Absolutely, I want to fight Tyson Fury. Right? Tyson Fury, do you want to fight Anthony Joshua? Absolutely, man, I want to fight Anthony Joshua. I'm going to make 25 million. Why wouldn't I want to fight him? Mm. So then you go to the promoter. Uh, do you want Anthony Joshua to fight Mike Tyson? Yeah, I do. No problem. So you go to his promoter. Mike, uh, Tyson's Fury, uh, Tyson Fury's promoter. Oh, I don't want to work with him. How much money? What's the no, split? No, I don't want to work with him. Yeah. I'm not working with him. It's such a disservice to the sport, well, isn't on it? A sec. Okay, can we get just to work with each other? Okay, we'll work with each other. So then they meet. They're like, yeah, okay, well, I want to be the main promoter, so I want 60%. We're not even talking about the fighters' purses. We're talking about what the promoters are making. And then Anthony Joshua is signed with Sky Sports or The Zone, and the other guy is signed with HBO. So now they're saying, well, hang on a second. We want to show it on HBO. No, the zone are showing it. So yes, you have... So many moving mechanical parts And then the it. fighters are like, well, I want to be the second to walk. I want to be bigger on the poster. I want my name top. There's a lot of ego in it. But across the board. Mm. Like it's all... Um, the fact that we see fights being made in boxing is amazing. <laughs> and that's why I really respect um, Cam Bosa's. Mm -hmm. He takes 
fucking hard fights. All of his fights are just... He doesn't cherry pick his fights. He had, what, Haney, Lomachenko, two fights with Haney? Well, the thing is, you have to remember, right, he was he was kind of like shoehorned in there, right? Mm. So he beats Lopez, right, which was phenomenal. Great fight. Right, which is phenomenal. You know, I, I did not think he could beat him, personally. Right, I was like, he yeah, doesn't have the tools, whatever. Goes out and he beats him. Well, Lopez was really hot at that point too. Mate, I was like, this is phenomenal. I was jumping out of my seat. I mm. couldn't believe it. Like, I couldn't believe it. That was a great fight. And he beat him. But now here's the problem. You're now gone from world level to elite level. Mm. Different game. Different game, bro. Different game. But he does 24 rounds with Haney. And he does 11 rounds with Lomachenko. Mm. The guy's good. He's one of the best. Yeah. It's just that division is so good. Mm -hmm. That being one of the best isn't good enough. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just... And for one moment. Yeah. Like, for one moment, he sat at the top. Oh, he was the best. He was the best at the time. Yeah. Undisputed, bro. It's insane to think that. Yeah. Now, Lomachenko, you know, when he talks about it in his interviews, he goes, you know, I wanted to become undisputed, but I had to beat the champion in each way. You know, mm. and first of all, you had to get a champion that wanted to fight. I'm not fighting Lomachenko. He'll beat me. The fucking demon. Yeah. <laughs> he's the fucking. Yeah. He's the worst worst matchup for anyone yeah. when he's on. Yeah. But George, you know, and you make your own look in this game. You know, the harder you train, the luckier you get. Because imagine he pulled it off. Well, he did. He beat Lopez for all the belts. Oh, I thought you were talking about Lomachenko. No, 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 no. I'm talking about Lopez. George. He beat Lope for all the belts. Yeah, that's so, insane. So you have George Cambosis, who will go down in history as the, uh, um, not the unified champion, what's it? The, Isn't it the unified? No, unified is when you're unified. Oh, is it the unified champion? Unified champion, yeah, he yeah, has yeah. all the belts. Yeah, so he'll go down in history as the unified four? champ. Is it four belts? And ring magazine. Mm. Yeah, see the belt system confuses and the Lama, fuck out of me. And too. Lamachenko. Has never been unified champion. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy to think. It's mad. That's crazy. I think he's got one more run in him. I hope he does, and I hope he does well. I no. think he has a run in him. I'd love to yeah. see Tank fight Garcia, though. So I don't know what yeah. you do with Loma. Maybe you give him Haney. Yeah, again. But, but and again, that's the thing with boxing, right? That's the thing with boxing. We're talking about three fighters. I oh, see. I don't know the rest of them. I wouldn't be able to fucking you tell go. you. And I can tell you the top fifty UFC and lightweights. And it's the same, right? So you walk in, you go into a Canelo card, right? And you look, look at the money Canelo's getting. He's getting twenty million for this fight. You're going, yeah, his opponent is getting two. And the uh, the first fight of the night's getting. F- they don't get paid. Two thousand no, dollars. No, 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 really. No, no. They don't get paid. See, everyone talks about MMA pay as if it's really heinous. Fighters probably should be getting paid more, but on an MMA card. Do you, know what we should do? Paid. do you know what we should do? We should grab these microphones and a camera, run out there and stop the bus. You know the bus at the bus stop? And go in with your microphone and say, excuse me, do you think you're getting paid enough? <laughs> no one's going to say they're getting paid enough. Right? Yeah. But again, as fans, as fans, we're like, what? You're only getting $100,000 for that fight? It's a lot of money. And you're like, <laughs> and you're like, and I'm not protecting, by the way, yeah. I'm not I'm not protecting anybody or I'm not doing anything. I'm not saying this. I'm just saying, right? I've trained fighters that have bled, bled for 500 bucks. Mm. That have lost brain cells and spent time in hospital for no money. Do you know what I mean? Mm. You're looking at fighters and you're going, look at that. They sell, they sell six t- 60 tickets, T-shirts, everything, and they're making 200 bucks. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to scream at the TV because your favourite fighter that nobody would know walking through Adelaide Airport is only making 1.2 million. <laughs> it's very true. <laughs> when you put it like that, it's very true. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Should they be making more? Absolutely, they should be making more. It ain't a bad the, living, though. Now, I think, I think some sports, I think there's some kind of uh, rule where a company needs to pay you like 5% of their, or 10% of their overall profits or mm. whatever, right? So let's say 1FC or, not 1FC, but another organization. They say, oh, well, we pay air fighters 10%, right? But the UFC only paid air fighters 1.2 or 1.5%. You're like, yeah, your company is worth, your company is making 300 million. 
UFC is worth $4 billion. Correct. <laughs> so do you want... Oh, it's worth more now. Yeah. So do you want your 5% of 100 million? Or do you want your 1.5% of 5 billion? Do you work with other promotions as well as the UFC? Yeah, yeah. Have you done work with like Bellator and PFL? No, 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 no. Again, it comes down to time. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It comes down to time. You know, I've been asked, you know, would I be interested in doing that kind of stuff, one FC or whatever, and I just said, look, I've just, I just don't have the time. I believe. I don't remember. I don't remember the intricacies of it, but I believe but again, PFL's so, so, yeah, coming here. Yeah, and sorry to interrupt you. No, you're right. You know, when I'm saying I've been asked, you don't know whether the person asking you is the person that should be asking you. Mm. So I'm saying to you, oh yeah, I've got, I've been asked to do one FC shows. Now, if someone from 1FC was to say, hey, Richie, who asked you? And I said, that guy there. He goes, we don't even know who he is. He doesn't work here. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? He doesn't work here. Yeah, so you have to be kind of careful about, you know, who you say yes to and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it comes back to another thing, you know, like, you know, I've been taught a long time ago, uh, you know, believe, you know, believe none of what you hear and only half of what you see. Mm. So... Until you're standing in the place doing it, or until the owner or whoever's in charge says, "Look, we want you to come out here," you know. So I have been asked to do bigger shows around the place, big promotions, but I just said no. So I don't know if that person that was asking me had the right to ask me or not. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So do you do you think working as a cut man, being a trainer, and being involved in the sport in that kind of aspect has enhanced watching fights for you? Like, can or diminished it like can you sit down and just enjoy a fight for a fight now oh yeah or do you kind of look for too many intricacies or overthink it no 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 i would i'd watch two uh raindrops running down a window pane yeah do you know what i mean yeah like i watch anything i watch darts snooker yeah football soccer like i watch everything you know well the european championships are on i'll watch a bit of where else were you born uh dublin Dublin, you're born in dublin yeah yeah. Fuck that was it. Cra- Did you go back? Yeah, yeah. But it was back last year. Me and my daughter went back. What was it like as an Irish person seeing the Bryce O'Connor? Yeah, it was great. You know, because very... it would have been a bit more personal, I guess, for the Irish. Yeah, and we're a small country, you know. And any time we get a polarizing or a world famous figure, we can hang our hat on them, you know. Mm. You know, but then again, like you know, it's and unfortunately, you know, like he's he's a young man. And he hasn't made all his mistakes yet. I right. hope he has. <laughs> I hope he has. Right? Yeah. But now, when I made all my mistakes, there was nobody there to take photographs of me. You, you weren't a world-known yeah. figure. And some of the mistakes I've made, if people saw that, I don't know if I'd ever be able to come back from that. And it would amplify times 10 when you have 100 million in the bank. Account. And there's the thing, right? And there's there's the thing. You know, people are like, you know, they, they, they view success on, you know, how much money you're making, you know? Like, I'm quite sure that there's rich people out there who have families and their sons and daughters are like, if we had no money, but you spent more time with me, I'd be happy. Mm. What we look at it, like, oh, yeah, well, you can buy happiness. <laughs> you know? Only poor people think that. Mm. You know? I've been broke my whole life. My whole life. I've never had anything, you know, from working class Dublin, from a broken home. Uh, I've had nothing, man. Like, nothing. And I know what it's like to have nothing. And uh, when you have a parent that's working, uh, one parent that's working, and they haven't got time, like, the, the best way I could say it here is, like, like my mom was treading water. She's working two, three jobs to keep food on the table. And she's treading water. And here's me saying... Hold me hand. And she goes, well, if I hold your hand, we're going to sink. So she has to keep treading water, right? So you grow up with that. And you come, and what happens is you're like, well, if we had more money, she wouldn't have had to tread water. We could have got a boat. And then she would have loved me more. And I would have felt more loved if we had more money. And you then start associating the fact that you weren't loved is because you didn't have money. So if I get money then I'll get love. And it's not true. Like, it's not true. Mm. You know? And you see it all the time. Like, you watch comments. Like, let's say Connor does something bad, right? And uh, and it's all on the news. And you go into the comment sections. 
And the comment sections, like someone will say, Jesus, he really shouldn't have done that. And then underneath that comment, yeah, look at you with your broke arse telling him what to do. He's got more money than you have mm. thing. And you're like... Instagram comment sections are wild. Yeah. <laughs> and you're just crazy. Yeah, and you're just like, bro, that's not... That's not it. Like, that's not it. You know, mm. you, you shouldn't be behaving like that. In you general. Know? In yeah. general. But again, as I said, you know, I'm 50 years old. You know, about seven years ago, I made massive, massive life changes. You know, I was in, like, I was, I was emotionally and spiritually uh, immature. You know, at 40 bloody seven. Oh, sorry, at 43. You know, of a, of a family, of a wife, of two kids, and drinking too much, and I'm not, like, I'm not present. You know, all that kind of stuff. And I know what my life was like before that. Mm. You know, and you can blame all you want. You can say, well, I have military trauma, I have childhood trauma, I have all these things that I can blame, you know, and point my finger at them and say, well, if you lived my life, you would act like this too, you know? So when I look at Connor, like, my brain goes off, for fuck's sake, mate. To pull it together. Do you know what I mean? And it's Because it seems like he's a very good person I at don't, but I, I don't know I, I, I think everyone deserves the benefit of the doubt now there's times man like don't get me wrong like I don't want to sit here and say oh yeah I'm squeaky clean mm. I'm all this there's times where you know we go to the gym on a Saturday morning you know and we're all in the gym and we're chatting and I'm like this guy whether it's Connor whether it's John Jones whether it's bloody whoever like, oh my god Jones is just another one that it's like fuck just pull your shit together yeah, but <laughs> you're like, but, the but, best in the world but just. think about it right like let's let, let's look at like let's look at John Jones right he, he crashes his car drink driving yeah I've done that mm. Conor McGregor's hit a guy in a bar I've done that mm. like there's nothing it's so true there's nothing yeah. they haven't done yeah the only difference between me and them is is that I'm older and I changed. But it's funny because when you see those things, you're like, oh, what a dickhead. But then you look, because you, you don't look back on your own personal things. Like, yeah, I've, I've gone into a fight in a bar before. 100%. I've crashed my car fucking I've, 10 I, times. Yeah. I've started a yeah. fight in a bar. Yeah. I'm the one that started it. I blindsided it. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's just so easy to point the finger. And again, in my opinion, you know, we're just lacking a little bit of compassion a little bit of empathy. And if you don't like what they're doing and they're really doing your head in, the great thing you can do, it's the best part of the internet, unfollow. Mm, but they don't because it's just addictive. It, being being upset is, they've figured it out on social media. They know that it, you engage with something more if you fucking hate it rather than if you love it. So the algorithms that they may, they've introduced, they're tailored to piss you off sometimes because they know that certain people will engage. I don't engage much on social media. Besides what I post, I don't comment on shit. Yeah, well, just because you're not commenting doesn't mean you're not engaged. Um, yeah, well, I'm not, I, I, but that I don't really, I'm not heaps active on social media. Yeah, yeah. But a lot of people get addicted to hating shit on social media and their pages are just filled with just yeah. shit mm -hmm. and it just, it ruins your brain. <laughs> yeah, and not even that though, like when, when eventually you come out the other side of it. Mm. Right? You either get married, you find somebody, you find a job, you find a purpose in your life that's greater than what you're doing. Mm. And you come to realise that all that time was wasted. Like how many times have you, like I, I coach boxing, right? And we do a class on a Tuesday and a class on a Saturday where anybody can come to. And uh, you get, every now and then, you might get, you know, an older guy that will come in or a younger guy or whatever and they turn up and they all say the same thing. I wish I started this sooner. Mm. Right? That's the same with your hatred or your resentment. You let go of it and you're like, oh, I should have let go of this sooner. Why was I holding on to this? You know? I genuinely believe that like, if, if you're finding yourself posting crazy shit online, <laughs> right? And that can be anything, mm. right? That can be you posting a selfie and pretending to be happy. Or that can be you posting stuff like fake angry. So, I mean, the government's out to get me. Mm. Whatever, right? Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Mm. I'm not here to tell you the government's not out to get you. You know what I mean? Because they could be. 
Again, they I don't most know. likely aren't they? <laughs> right, but probably not. Yeah. Right, but what, it's just it's all that energy wasted. Yeah. Wasted, you know. And it's not until you find a purpose, you know. Like I could be bringing my kid to the cinema, or we mm. could be going down to the skate park. But no, I'm here going. You know. <laughs> The government's out to get me, or John Jones won that fight, or the referee's on the take, or the judges are corrupt. Wait, mate, just walk away. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so you brought your hand wrapping stuff today. Oh, I did. Yes. Do you want to sort me out? I do. Do you reckon you could do it from here, or do you yeah. want me to come around there? No, no, we can do it from here, I think. What I'll do, I'll lower this camera a little bit so you can see my hand. Yeah. So we'll give people a little sneak peek into the. Whose glove is that? Take the Lombards. Oh, no shit. Miles gave it to me. He was a savage, man. Oh, he's a big, big dude. I think he does bare knuckle now. Yeah, he does, doesn't he? Which is, <laughs> that would be a great <laughs> sport for you to fucking attend. That's just a wild, wild thing. I tell you, Muay Thai is, a, is like, if you want to learn how to work cuts, Muay Thai, mate. Elbows, knees. Oh, yeah. Fun yeah, stuff. yeah. But they're really good at it. Yeah, and they got sharp, a lot of them got yeah. sharp elbows. Yeah. Alrighty. Right, so we need... What do we need? Hmm. What have we got? Oh, we could use one of those weights. Let me just do that. Yeah, yeah. Do your thing. Can you clear that thing? Yeah, yeah, I'll clear this out. Never used. Never used. No. <laughs> Not at all. What the fuck is that? Oh. You'll be able to reach for us now, won't you? I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited. Just put it, so rest my arm on here. Yeah, so put it, no, put it there, put it there. Put it there. Yeah, and you're going to give me your other arm. That's it. That's it. So we'll switch that. Put it on Hector's thing. Just, Can you see that? Yeah, that's good. One sec, I'll just move that there. There you go. Perfect. Your cables are under there, I think. Oh, that's all good. That'll be fine. Okay. I bought you a roll of tape so you can have that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah, so you can't... Uh, it's a different material to what I thought it would be. In what way? It's like it feels um more clothy than I thought. Yeah, it's just the same as that, only, yeah. has, a, only has a pattern on it, you know? Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. So the first thing we need to do... Is we need to make a knuckle pad for you. Get that right there. There you go. Is the, it in focus? Yeah, that's good. Right, do you want to just slide in a tiny bit? Because I want to I get to there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is a bit crazy. <laughs> so the first thing I want to do is make a knuckle pad for you. Yeah. Right? So I'm going to wrap your hands the way I would wrap anyone's hands in MMA. Right? So I'm going to make a knuckle pad. So all I do is I take this. So this this uh, this roll is fifteen yards long, or fifteen meters, right? And what I want to do is I want to make a knuckle pad for you. And what we would do is we'd be out the back, so we get there early, and we would make, you know, let's say I'm wrapping seven fighters, I'd make fourteen of these knuckle pads. And just have them sitting on and the side. And have them ready to go. So. Because the last thing you want to be doing is sitting in the chair like that. Yeah. Waiting on me to do this. Right? So we want to be always prepared. Be ready. You know, my old uh, army unit, that was its motto. Etra pre. Which means be ready. So you're always ready. So we'll do this 15 to 20 times. And again, the thing about getting your hands wrapped is if you were getting ready for a fight, you'd be nervous, right? Regardless of who you are. And uh, have you been counting? No. Oh, come on. <laughs> I was supposed to be on the ball. No, 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 no. Worry, do you feel like it's your, almost your job to kind of calm the fighter? Well, here's the thing. It's not my job. That's the, that's the fighter's job and the coach's job, right? But I can absolutely make it worse. You can aid them. into it. Oh, really? Yeah. So I have the potential to make it worse for them or better for them, mm. right? So... Oh, yeah, got you something else in there. That's a, you know, that's a wristband from a fighter's wristband. So when we... When oh, we, yeah, really? So when we wrap our hands, we have to cut that wristband off. 
Oh wow! Yeah, and I, yeah, it ended up in my bag, so I did. So we'll say that that's um, Anderson Silva's, eh? Yeah, it can make it can be anybody's. We'll say that's Anderson's. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that's a fighter's wristband. Right, so that's our knuckle, right? Our knuckle pad. Yeah. So that'll fit your hand, no problem. You know, obviously now if you have Brock Lesnar or whatever, we're gonna make a much bigger one. Okay, so. So the the last thing we want for you. In the is for your hand to be able to move in the glove, mm. right? Like that's really bad if your hand can move in the glove, right? So we need the wrap and your hand. So when it goes into the glove, it all becomes one piece. Yeah, right. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. So when people come in and say, "Oh, I don't want my hands wrapped because it's going to take away my punching power," you have a higher chance of getting injured. Breaking a wrist or... Yeah, or definitely scuffing your knuckles because mm. there's a gap between your knuckle and the glove. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So you want to go in there nice and snug so it becomes one piece. Yeah. Yeah? And also it protects your hand. Right? So now we take the rest of this. So what I want to do now is I just, I'll just wrap your hand. So make a fist for me. So we want to make sure that your hand is wrapped. How are you going to punch? Yeah. Right? So we don't want to be wrapping your hand like that or like that. Right, so again, as I was saying, so you've come in here, you've sat down, you've been moving around, you know, shadow boxing, doing a few bits and bobs, going to the toilet, being on your phone, chatting to your coach, doing all this, and then you come to me and you sit down. That's it. You have to stay there. Mm. So now your brain is going, oh Jesus, you know, this is the moment you like. This is real. A hundred percent. Yeah. Right. So I can make you more nervous. We said, oh, Jesus, oh, this, oh, your hand, you know what I mean? Or we can be lighthearted. How you going, champ? How are things? You know what I mean? Don't kill anybody with this, you know what mm. I mean? Like, all that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> Stitch was famous for saying, you know, are you a puncher or a grappler? You know? And they'd say, oh, yeah, I'm a puncher. He said, all oh, right, I'll give you the puncher's rap. Oh, no, I'm a grappler. I'll give you the grappler's mm. rap. It's the same, same rap. thing. It was the same rap. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But it was just to diffuse the situation. Or not the situation, just to diffuse the guys. So bring them more lighthearted. A bit of lightheartedness. Make them more personal. A hundred percent. And make them feel that everything's going to be okay. Do you know what I mean? So. I'm and do you have your own... Do you, So you obviously would have learned how to rap from someone. Do you, like, implement your own techniques that you've learned and your own, fl- like, yeah. almost flavour on it? Yeah. So now I have my own kind of style that I do, you know? So we want to get around there. And because I can't feel what you're feeling, I have to communicate with you all the time, you know? So mm. if you're saying, is that too tight? How does that feel? Mm. You know? And because you've never had your hand wrapped before, you probably don't know what it's supposed to feel. Yeah, like. I have no idea. Right? So when we were over at Road to UFC, we were wrapping people's hands who've never wrapped their hands. Mm-hmm. They're like, oh, that's tight. And you're like, it's supposed to be tight, you know? Some guys are open up. Some guys, they don't want their thumb wrapped. Some guys want their thumb wrapped because uh, the second most uh, place we find injuries is in the thumb. Yeah, broken thumbs. Or yeah. So if they don't, just spread your fingers for me. So if they don't want their thumb wrapped, we just do it like this. No thumb. Right? But what we try and suggest is that we wrap the thumb. Mm. Right? So it'll come around. Around here. Why wouldn't some fighters... Is it is that like a grappling thing? Or it's just their own personal preference. Yeah, personal preference. Yeah, it's their own personal preference. It's up to them. Make a fist for me. Open. Good. Go one more round. Why not? Here we go. Make a fist for me. And then we'll put the knuckle pad on. Open up. So how much How much of this... Will you, will you use the whole thing? No. I was going to use maybe like a quarter of it. Uh, well, spread your fingers for me. Nice and wide. That's it. So that was 15 metres or yards? Uh, I think it's metres, yeah. Yeah, right. I say yards, but I shouldn't. But I should really know, shouldn't I? Metres, yards, same, same. Same, same. Same, same. Come around here. And then I can put a bit of pressure on that one. Make a fist for me. Open up. So do you have any workshops planned in South Australia? Um, I'm doing one in Melbourne next month, and then I'll start, uh, I'll start, uh, put your fingers for me really wide. So if you, if you have your fingers narrow like this, 
and I wrap your hand when you go to make a fist, yeah, it'll push yeah. you. Yeah, so you need to spread them really wide. Right. There we go. Now, obviously, I'd be standing up for this and make a fist, and it'd be a lot faster, of course, but yeah. and then we just finish this off here. So one roll of gauze got us a knuckle pad and a full wrap. Like so. Right? So now I'm going to add the tape. But before I add the tape, I want to be asking, how does that feel? So yeah, that feels good. Feels nice? Nice. I wrap my hands way too tight at the gym. Yeah. But then it's again, it's, it's, it's just, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You're just... Uh, You're just learning, you know. You have to figure out what you like and what you don't like. So you're coming around with the tape. And again, not all tapes are the same, you know. Like I found, like, I'm after finding a tape that I like and a gauze that I like. Yeah. And it's made here in Australia. So it's Australian. Do made. I still want to be spreading my fingers? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you, we're okay because we're only on the wrist now. So now I want to come around the thumb again. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get to make a... A fist for me now. Bring it to me. That's a proper fist. And I just got to make sure that this isn't too tight. So how does that feel? On that feels hand? good, yeah. That's good. Let me cut it off. Right. So, so when we're looking for tapes, right, how easy is it to pull off the roll and how easy is it to rip? Mm. Right? So there we go here. I might want to be pushing down. I'm just going to stand up, yeah? Yeah, yeah, you're good. Uh, where am I? I'll bring my mic up with me. Look at that. Because I'm standing up, it's easier. Will you be able to hear those kids? Oh, so they don't really bleed through the mics too much. There's a fucking yeah. dog next yeah, door, though. Right, so, a universal rule, right, with wrapping hands. Is that the tape? Make a fist. Is that the tape? Is an inch back from the knuckles? Hold look. That is so much. That is so different to how I thought you would do it. Yeah. You know, like I thought you'd just wrap it around the fucking hand. No, 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 no. So we need a turn. So gather up this bar, and now I'm going to use this tape. And what I'm going to do is spread it down the middle. Spread it turn for me. I'm just going to, I don't know, people are going to be bored watching this. Oh, I mean, oh, this is, this is fascinating to me. I've, I, this is way more technical than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, so turn over, make a fist for me. And now I want to push that there. So basically what this tape does, this tape doesn't really have any support uh, properties. What it does is it stops the knuckle pad from rolling back up when yeah, you put right. your hand in the glove. Done. Make a fist. And again, like, it's an enjoyable process if you do it right, you know? Open, close, open, close. Just open, close, open, close. Just make sure that it's not digging into your web. No, that's good. Turn. Awkward position to make a fist. And again, because I'm not uh, standing up. So I'd be like standing over you looking down. Yeah. Like I'm kind of far away at the yeah. moment. But open, close, open, close. And then, so what we want to do now is so I would have a roll like this. Set up. Set up with just only the skinny bits. Yeah. Right? But because I haven't, I'll go back to this roll. So again, one roll of gauze, one roll of tape will work for one hand. Jeez. That's a lot, eh? Yeah. 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 Make a fist. It's a lot more comfortable than I thought it was going to be. Is it? Hmm. 
but that's because I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can definitely see, though, if you do it too tight, how uncomfortable yes. it could be. Yes, absolutely. Open. So it's all about me asking you, how do you feel? It's not about how I feel. Mm. Make a fist for me, real tight. How does that feel? Yeah, that feels good. Okay, it up. So is there a reason you don't go all the way around? Is that just so it's not as tight? Yeah, so it's not as tight, yeah. You need to just keep breaking it off, put the pressure. Because there's no pressure coming. We don't need pressure on the bottom yeah. going up. We need pressure on the top going Going down. down. Right. Open. Spread your fingers as wide as you can. All right, so that's the uh, that's the pressure going down. So what I want to do is I want to just try and mitigate this movement here. Mm. Right, so I'll just do an X across the back of your hand like so. And again, remember, the tape can't be an inch from your... The, the knuckles have to be exposed. Yeah. You can't put tape on the knuckles. Not in MMA, anyway. In bare knuckle? In bare knuckle, no, because it's bare knuckle, right? But don't they, don't they, don't they wrap their hands for bare yeah, knuckle? from their back. Uh, they wrap wrist, wrist yeah. support. So see what you've got on now? See yeah. where the tape is? That's how you would wrap a bare knuckle box on. Yeah. But you wouldn't have any of this. You wouldn't have the pad you made. Yeah. Yeah. And the knuckles would Obviously, be Obviously, yeah, it's bare knuckle. And the knuckles would be exposed. Right. And now what I would normally do is I would finish all that off mm. with this tape. But what I'm going to do is, because I gave you a roll of that, I'm going to do it with the oh. UFC tape. So then when you cut it off, you can have it, you know? That's awesome. So I'll make it look nice and neat. Right. So what I want to do is, I want to do this entire wrap. Nice and neat. So it looks... This is really more presentation. Good. This is presentation. So your hand is now protected. This is just pure, pure... Aesthetic. Yeah, now at the UFC, we wouldn't use white tape. It'd be all UFC tape. Yeah, right. Right? Make a fist for me. And again, I'd be flying through this. I'd be doing this like in five or six minutes. Open up. How many fight? Do you do every... Uh, like no, there's half five. the fighters no, at no, night? Or? So there's five of us, right? Make a fist. And probably 17 fights. Yeah. So what happens is is that we all wrap at the beginning. And then two guys go out to the cage, walk the cage. Three guys stay out the back. And then we rotate. Mm. You know? Open. That is fucking excellent. Open. How long did it take you before you were confident? Um, at the elite level. Oh. God, sometimes you still don't be confident, you know what I yeah. mean? Like sometimes, like a little bit of an imposter syndrome, almost. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's definitely there, you know. But um, now I'm kind of like, you know, I know who I am, what I am, and and I guess I guess one of the great things is that if it was all to be over tomorrow, I'd be okay with it because it's something that I've done it now. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, no shit. And I always say this, and I know it's a bit corny, you know, Torn? Like fist. And I always say, you know, 50 G's, baby. 50 G's, baby. <laughs> That's it. That's it. That's phenomenal. Show that. Show that to the camera. Wait up. Just gotta, if you can see that. That's so good.
That's so cool. It's so much more comfortable than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Like, I, that doesn't really at all put any pressure on me. Mm. That's excellent. Yep. So what I'll do is I'll take it off you in such a way that it stays uh, together. We are back. So I'll give us your, yeah, so just turn it over. And again, a good scissors is worth its weight in gold, you know. See, like you see lots of people out the back trying to cut things off. And so now we just take this like this. And then just ease your fingers out nice and relaxed. Oh, wow. And then what we do is you give these back to the fighter and then he either gives them to his uh, sponsors or yeah, whatever. Right. But you will be able to put yours. Oh, that's awesome. In there. Thank you so much for that. You're a legend. You're good at what you do. <laughs> You're very good at what you do. Yeah, well. One 10, of 10,000 hours. One of the girls that was, um, well, it's, yeah, one of the girls that came to, uh, she's a paramedic, and she was one of the girls that was, um, that was doing the, uh, oh, was, thank you. She was doing, um, she was doing the hand wrapping for the element fight night and she turned around to me and she said uh she goes what an what a crazy thing to be really good at it is a very do you know i always think that about things though it's like even when i watch say things like basketball it's like how funny that these people are just so elite at throwing a ball into a hole yeah. from 15 or 10 meters yeah. away like it just baffles me like and you yeah. you're just really good at wrapping hands and working cuts and working cuts it's crazy you know and the funny thing is like I, i've always so when i was saying to you when i was growing up i didn't have anything you know and but when i got older i um when i got older i i kind of i got into sports uh there was a there was a course that we it was like a tafe mm. course but it was in ireland and it was around coaching sports, how to be a good coach. And uh, it was brand new. And I put my name down for it and I got it. And I fell in love with the, the psychology aspect of coaching, mm. you know. And after that course, I went away. I joined the army. I went over to France. I joined the, the, the Foreign Legion over there. And um, Oh, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so I did that. Oh, so you were in the fucking army, army. You didn't, like, just do mandatory service or anything. No, 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 no. Yeah, right. so it was uh, pre-9-11. So, you know, if you'd have joined the army, you wouldn't have got to see much, you know. So I went over there. and Yeah, that was good. And um, did, a, did a bit there and uh, continued to box there. And um, But when I got out of that, I was always about learning, you know. So I went back to college or university and I did a diploma in sports psychology and uh, so much of cuts and wrapping hands is psychological mm. you know you're getting a fighter at their probably most vulnerable point in the night you know so you have to be really on point with how you treat them how you talk to them even if they're not your fighter and sometimes they don't even speak your language and there's an interpreter That's there. another barrier that you, know? you don't really think of. Yeah. So you got to be quick. You got to be gentle. You got to be compassionate. You got to be tolerant. You You'd know? almost know a bit of Portuguese by now. <laughs> well, Korean or Japanese yeah. or whatever. And, you know, to wrap their hands and do all that. And But also then, you know, if a fighter gets cut, you know. So let's say Matty gets a cut. Right? He's fighting a guy. It's a head clash or whatever. And they call the doctor up onto the apron. And the other guy is across the ring and he's like, fuck yeah, I got him. No, I got him now. You know, he's caught. The doctor's looking at him. Not a couple of punches, they'll call this fight off. And the blood is coming down his face. Right? And then the bell rings. And he comes back to the corner. And Jez will go, you go in, sort that cut out. Because sometimes the cut man, normally the cut man stays on the outside. Not in the UFC though. In boxing, you're only allowed one cornerman in the corner. Everyone mm. else has to be outside the ring. 
So you'll go in through the ropes. Excuse me. You'll go in through the ropes and you'll work the cut. So see, see your little ring here? Yeah. So you'll have your coach in here. And then the corner man will come through these two ropes to work on the cut. Is that sufficient enough? Sufficient. Unless the cut's really bad, mm. then we'll swap. Then the cut man will go in and the coach will come oh, Okay, so so any, it, there can only be one, but it doesn't matter who it is. That's right. So yeah. if the cut is pretty bad, you can be the one and yeah. their coach will be hanging yeah. in the ropes. Now, years ago in MMA, if a, if a cut happened, so two coaches are allowed to go into the corner in MMA, and if a cut happened, one coach would have to stay and the cut man would go in. They've changed that rule now. Now the cut man goes in all the time. Mm. Goes in every single time. It makes sense. Makes sense, right? There's also a new rule that's after coming in where if it's an accidental clash of heads, for example, and you get your five minutes, so another way to give you five minutes for a nutshell, yeah. you also get five minutes for a bad, like an eye poke. Any um, sort of... Anything that's illegal. Illegal. Right, accidental. And the new rule is, is that after the doctor goes in and has a look, the referee can then bring the cut man in and the cut man can walk on his call. Oh, okay. That's, see, that makes sense because if it's an accidental head yeah. clash, it, both the fighters fucked up. They yeah. probably both need attention and mm. it'll make the fight last yeah. longer. If Correct. And that's a, that, that's a relatively new rule. And uh, but Is that implemented or is that getting implemented? No, it's already in. It is? Yeah. And uh, Now, I'm talking about the highest level here. Like I don't know how these rules get implemented at the lower level. How do you fix an eye poke? You don't. I was like, look, there's nothing you can really do in the no, corner. No, no, If it's no, a no, pretty they, bad eye poke. Yeah, they just have to blink it out or get on with it. The fucking sucks. It's, yeah. That would be one of the worst yeah. things when you get like a pulled knuckle in your eye. I can only imagine. Is there some, is, have you been in, have UFC aren't looking to do anything with their gloves really, are they? They've got a new glove now. Isn't that just a new colour? No, no, it it's design? a whole new glove, yeah. Is it's it? a whole new I glove. I the yeah. gold ones. No, no, red. Did I, I put one on my uh, Instagram. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, are they angled one. down a bit? No, 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 same. It's the same style. It's the same everything. You cannot, like, people think, right? You see you see boxers when they're boxing. They're throwing out feints like anything. They just don't have the... But their hands are open. They got the, oh, yeah. They're, throwing, they're not throwing like this. They're yeah. throwing like that. Their hands are open. Your hands are open until the moment of impact. Yeah. Because if you were to clench your fist for the whole fight, you're fucking tired. Yeah. So when boxers are parrying and blocking, their hands are open. You just can't see it because it's in the glove. Mm. In MMA, you see it because your fingers are out of the glove. There's nothing you can really do about it. Even no, if you were to not. bring it all the way around and cover the fingernails, the finger would work its way out. It means you can't grab or manipulate. But again, you know. That's a hard issue. That one would be a hard issue to solve because then you'd be diminishing like. Yeah. And I'm not an expert. A lot of things. Like, I am not an expert on. Eye pokes. I'm not an expert on glove design. If there's somebody in a shed out there going, look at this design, it works. Didn't Trevor Whitman do one? I don't know. Onyx? Does don't he know. have the brand Onyx? Don't know. Don't know. Oh, I think it's Trevor Whitman who I believe I'm not. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I'm yeah. pretty sure it's Trevor Whitman has a brand called Onyx, and he developed a like a prototype of an MMA glove, and it was really good. Mm. But I think the UFC were looking at it, but they didn't. They didn't. Um, yeah. end up doing anything with it yeah well you have to remember right they will take whatever they've got like they don't this doesn't come into a room where there's like two guys two girls who've never fought before and they look at the glove and go nah mm. like if they like something and this isn't just the UFC this is everybody this is any company they'll say okay give us a couple we'll test them out right it's like uh, so there's a new camera coming out by Canon Canon are bringing out a camera called the R1 it's meant to be their flagship number one camera they don't just build a million of them and sell them. They design them. They make prototypes. They give them to photographers. The photographers go out into the world. They go to Alaska, Iceland. They tell them what there's good about them, they what's shoot, bad about them. They shoot them. the Formula One. They do all this. They say, look, this is great. This isn't great. Change this, change that, blah, blah, blah. And then the concept becomes, it goes from a prototype to an actual made thing. So if they've, if they've looked at the design of a glove, They've brought it to the performance center. They've given it to fighters. They've mm. looked at them and says, which do you prefer? And they will settle on the glove that they end up with. Mm. I'm assuming. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because that's how most people work things out. That's how it gets done. You know? So, yeah, I would say whatever they settle on, they settle on. So fighters obviously think they need their fingers exposed. 
They want to be able yeah. to move them, to manipulate them. And if that's the case, they need to be exposed. I think it's important for MMA for yeah. them to be able to move their fingers. Yeah. I don't know, yeah. little nuances like that mm-hmm. when you're grappling and stuff yeah. is very important. Yeah, and if a finger is exposed, guess what? Mm. It can go in your eye. Mm. And that's just the way it is. You know? Yeah, but, there's uh, been some fucking... Oh, there's nothing worse than seeing someone's knuckle go in someone's eye. And deep. Oh, when it goes like... I can't remember who it was. Remember that? Look, it kind of went right into the eye yeah, all the way. Yeah, who was that? It was a heavyweight. It was a heavyweight. Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah. But yeah, it's always just when they're prodding, but they're trying to find the range. There's nothing you can really do about it. But like you said, people don't understand when boxers are just throwing out their hands. They're throwing it with an open fist just, fist just to fight their, find mm. their range, but their hand's not exposed. Yeah. Yeah. So again, like just back to the back to the complete fighter care thing, you know. Uh, so that promoter, he wants. So we got everyone up to the level of this, mm. or close enough to it, and because uh, anyone can do this, like anybody can do this. I was watching. It's definitely so. It, it's not impossible, but there is definitely more, way more technique to it than I thought there would be. Yeah, and and like everything else, the more you do it, the better you get, mm. and the better you get at something, the less the less you have to prove. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like the pressure on that was perfect. Like you didn't do it too tight. You but I imagine when, I imagine the hardest thing when you're learning is not learning how tightly to do it. Yeah, like I, I've seen guys like at the highest level, at the highest level, like have people turn up and say, oh, this is a bit tight. And have a cut man like turn around and say, we don't cut, we don't cut wraps off. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, we do. <laughs> We do cut them off. Yeah. And I just go in, cut it off, and we wrap them. It's only a bloody wrap, mate. Like, it's not... It's fucking cloth. It's not, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. not a personal attack on you. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Just cut it off. Do it again. You know, it's all about the fighter. The fighter has to be feel a, a million dollars. Do you know what I mean? And that's our job. And has the seminar in Melbourne sold out? Uh, it's not a sellout. I think you can just... Anyone can go along to it. Yeah. Do all that. Yeah, just uh, talk to Peter Look. Hatton there at Alpha. He's uh he's organising it. Yeah, I think there might be forty people already on it or whatever. Mm. You know, so I'll go up. I'll I'll supply all the stuff. I have a I have a partnership with uh with Sting Sports. They're an Australian company, and um they high make, quality materials as well. Yeah, it has to be high quality materials. Like some of the like it felt nice on my hand. Like it yeah. feels, doesn't feel um cheaply made. Yeah, and I've like all type is not equal. You know mm. what I mean? Like, it's it's just not. And look, if you gave me bad tape and bad gauze, I'd still wrap your hands and it'd still do a good job. But it's it takes longer. It's more finicky, you know? So it's about getting in, getting out and thing. And another thing about the supply is, like, when when Matt asked me to, uh, to do this thing for his show, yeah. he was like, can you supply the gear? And I was like, well, no. I can't get any gear. He's like, yeah, either can I. I can't get anywhere. Like, it's crazy expensive and all that kind of stuff. So that's when I reached out to Sting. I said, look, listen, I'm thinking of doing this. Would you come on board? And they said, yeah, look, we'll do a little deal with you. I was like, maybe I should make a little business out of this. So I decided to give it a crack. And we'll see where it goes from there, you know. I think you're going to do really good things with it. And it's no one better to learn from. Mm. So there's going to yeah. be some good cut men running around yeah. in the future. Or cut hopefully, women. hopefully, you know, hopefully, hopefully coaches are out there and they're not, you know, they're not breaking vials of adrenaline ringside. You know, like I've seen guys break vials of adrenaline ringside and dab the broken glass onto the bloody, onto the cotton tip and just trying to stick in it. And it's like some and crazy stuff. Like it, you have to remember, it's the wild west out there Mm -hmm. you know and again i'm not here to tell you what to do i'm not here to tell you how to do it none of that i'm just saying this is what we do at the top level hygienic safe efficient and good for the fighter Mm. do you know what i mean and all i'm doing is i'm not giving you a qualification i'm not saying you know if you do this course you'll get you know, you get a certificate and a qualification or anything like that. It's just a knowledge transfer. This is what I know, and I'm going to transfer a bit of this knowledge onto you. And it's up to you if you use it or not. There's some coaches out there that are great at wrapping hands. There's some coaches out there that are great at working cuts. Do you know what I mean? They might go, well, I don't want to do that. It doesn't interest me. I'm not, or it does interest me, but I don't want to do it. I don't need to do it. That's great. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, 
it's not like everybody needs to do this because I'm the best cunt man in the world and you need to learn from me. Mm. No, it's not. It's not at all. It's also cool just to learn a new skill. Yeah. It's like you don't have to even go that deep with it. If you just want to learn a new skill and learn the nuances of the sport and mm-hmm. if you love the sport and want to learn about it, it's just cool to just learn new shit sometimes. Yeah, yeah. go and hang out with people who are like-minded. Yeah, go meet really. like-minded people. Yeah. Go meet people in the niche that you enjoy. 100%. There's nothing better than meeting someone and they they can converse with you about fights. Yeah. Like It's a very nice feeling when you just meet someone Mm-hmm. And you can have a really nice conversation about fights because it is a very niche sport at yeah. the end of the day. Or it's a niche world at the end mm-hmm. of the day. And one of the girls that came on the, the, the four-week block, she was a fighter. So she wasn't even rapping hands. Mm. Just she wanted just, to know how it works. She just came along, yeah, Tabitha. You know? Oh, is she from uh, Barossa or something? Yeah, 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 she's a champ. Oh, she's a gorgeous girl. Yeah, yeah she's she awesome. Was, yeah, she was, her, her and her boyfriend, her and her partner fought on the same night. She was doing commentary at Pride last week for yeah. Jack's fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lovely, lovely people, her and her partner, you know. But they're great people as well up there at Element, you know. Matt, and then at CCMA, you know, you have... Uh, Alan. Alan, you know. That's where my son dude. does his jiu-jitsu. You oh, know? really? Yeah, he loves it there. Yeah, Alan's a, Alan's a weapon. Yeah, Keegan, I think, is the kid's coach. Well, mm. he is not, I think. Keegan is the kids coach and he was doing the hand wraps. He was one of the hand wrappers for CCMMA. Yeah. You know, it was great. It was really, 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 really good. And, uh, and Matt just said, look, I'll, we'll do it again the next time, you know, we'll yeah. do it again the next time. And it's a thing like maybe, you know, two promoters that are out there, you know, like not all promoters supply gauze and tape, you know, so that's all on the coaches, but it's another expense. Yeah. You know, and I know like, Coaches and fighters like, look at this promoter. They're making loads of money. You know? uh, they're making fuck all. <laughs> they, at the local know, level, they're lucky to make money. Oh, hundred. Well, they, you know, like I'm just saying, the reason they make money mm-hmm. is because they have to be sure. Yeah. That everything is paid for and thing like that's what they have to try and do. They have to make a profit, you know. And then if you rock up and say, "Hey, you thinking about putting on a cook crew or a, trying to buy hand wrap and stuff?" And they're like, "Jesus," you know, like I'm. You know, I'm putting in all this time. Like you say, let's say a promoter goes, I make 10 grand on this show, right? They go, 10 grand for that show for one night? That's great. You're like, bro, one night. One night. I've been working for five months on this yeah. shit. <laughs> yeah. 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 I had to rearrange seven fights last week because two yeah. people missed weight, oh, one, one fucking... Oh, and the sleepless nights yeah. and the arguments. Yeah, it's crazy. Like you can be the nicest person in the world, but you'll go grey. Yeah. <laughs> It, I was talking to Carly, the promoter of Pride, last week. I know Carly very well, yeah. Just talking to her, I was like, fuck, you got a lot on your plate, mate. Because <laughs> like, yeah. her show was huge. She had like fucking 36 mm-hmm. fights on it or something. Or yeah. like uh, th- 42 fighters on it or something. It was like 20 yeah. fights all up. Yeah, and if you look at like, like this, if you look at promote, like big, big promoters, they don't have fighters on. All they do is promote. Mm-hmm. They run the show, mm-hmm. you know? Small town shows like you, it doesn't really work like that. Now we we call, let's we're calling Pride a small town show, right? But boy, God, she did an amazing job. Phenomenal show. Do you know what I mean? Like it's Phenomenal. like a big show, mm. right? But she's a coach. She's running the thing. She has to be there. She's for, jumping in between corners. And yeah, shit. like the, there's some promoters that aren't, aren't even there for when the ring gets set up. Yeah, but she's setting up the ring. She's, she's cornering people. She's doing everything. everything. She does a very good job. You know, but it's like she. Obviously, I don't want to tell her how to do her job, you know, but she's going to have to at some stage... Allocate people to do certain things. And step away. That's what know? I was. we were talking about. I was like, yeah. as it as it grows bigger, you won't have to do the setup. Yeah. Like you, your job will just be to promote or to yeah. match make because she yeah. loves matchmaking. Yeah. So it's the same as... like It's not the same. Like It's obviously on a much bigger thing, but it's the same as the hand wrapping for coaches. Do you know what I mean? Do you want to be the coach? Like, let trust... The guy to wrap your guy's hands. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So you can do coach shit. And so you can do coach shit. Or if you're the coach and you want to wrap the guy's hands because you only have one or two fighters on, then you wrap their hands. But let the cunt man walk the cuts. You coach. Mm. Like if the fight's going on and your fighter gets cut and you're the coach, now all of a sudden you have to put your head in your bag, take your eyes off the fight. When you should be. Getting all your shit ready. And then when he comes in, you're working the cut and you're not giving instruction. Because you're working the cut. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Now, again, small hall shows, people can't afford cut men. They can't afford. And even 
the thing is for me is like I'm saying don't pay a guy train a guy mm. take one of your guys that's in your gym you know he's not really into the fighting anymore he wants to get into a bit of coaching say well look do you want to specialise do you want to become a cut man do you want to be our gym's cut man do you know what I mean and you teach him how to wrap hands then he has a rapport with the fighters so the fighters don't mind getting their hands wrapped by him do you know what I mean mm. like Jez is the head coach he's the head coach at Rikers He's the owner and the coach. He, everything goes through him. Everything. But I wrap the hands. Mm. It's not because he can't wrap hands. It's I do it. Do you know what I mean? So he's allocating. He's allocating roles. You know? Yeah, so there's no confusion on the night. Everyone knows exactly what they're doing. What it's they're like doing. clockwork. 100%. And again, like, and again, so we go to big shows and there's never a problem. You know, okay, we've got four people. You know, we bring Charlie Chow that comes out the back. He does the grappling with Maddie or whatever. I'm out there wrapping the hands. I work the cuts. Jez is the head coach. That's three people, right? And But the promoters, like, th- th- whatever, in Melbourne or of wherever we are, you know, it's like, oh, well, hang on a second, you know, like, we have to ask for an extra wristband. Say, hey, look, can we get an extra wristband to do this? And like, well, hang on, you're only allowed two, you're only allowed this. So there's all kinds of stuff you have to kind of negotiate or... What's the word? You know, get over or navigate, whatever. Navigate yeah. is the word I'm looking for, you know. Like, it's not like I'm not looking for an extra wristband because I want to get someone in for free. I'm not saying, look, it's just we need, this is how we work. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I've never had an issue with a promoter or anything saying no. Like, they're, yeah, promoters are great people. No, a lot of them. Yeah. Most and, of them. And, you know, it's like it, anything, there's it, always yeah, one dickhead. Yeah, but not even that, though. Like, and, and right, you look at, you look like because I, I watched the the, the uh, I watched the uh, the episode with Carly, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> and you like, Carly is the most beautiful, caring person. She's lovely, right? She's gorgeous, and well, you, she doesn't get a night's sleep because she's waiting on a phone call back <laughs> yeah. because someone's pulled out, right? So yeah. she's tired. She has a job to do. She turns up at six o'clock in the morning at the gym to train somebody. Mm. Right? Then she has her own fighters. Right? Gets a phone call and goes, uh, Carly, you're not going to believe this. I'm a kilo over and all this kind of stuff. I need to. And normal right? life shit because you, you still I mean? have a life right. outside and then of she fighting. Has, and then all of a sudden, then someone's like, oh, the fucking ring, the nut on the ring broke. Mm. Or the fucking rope broke. Yeah. And, all of a sudden, and then dickhead Richie at the weigh in walks and says, oh, listen, I need an extra wristband. Yeah. Fuck off. It's the last fucking straw. It's the last fucking straw. 100%. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So then it's up to me to go, look, I cannot take this personally. Like, Mm. I love that girl. Like, I'm not. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I cannot. No, she's never done that to me. Yeah. I'm just. just, just It's a hypothetical. 100%. You know? And then I just need to go back when she's in better form and say, look, listen, about that wristband. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? She might still say no. She might say, look, listen. People are only getting... But 95% months. of the time, it was just the time and place. At the time and place. And then that's, you know, you know. so you just got to you gotta remember, you know. And it's easy, like it's easy to look at any promoter. Like I do it, I've done it myself. Have you have you um, had many conversations or a conversation with Dana? No, never. Before? Never, never, we, never, never. No? Never. Don't see him, yeah. Again, delegates. He doesn't do anything. He's the best at it. 100%. I, I'll, give you the, I'll give you an example of the UFC and the people that walk in it. There's a guy that works on the ring, on the, on the octagon, and they travel all over the world, putting the octagon up and taking it down, right? That's their job. They're based out of Las Vegas. There's a big warehouse there. They've got how many cages, and they're always tinkering with it. They're always making adjustments, so it'll go up and down quicker, right? And I'm chatting to him, and he's telling me about his job and all that kind of stuff, but he, they also double up on the night as the people that open and close the gate. And I'm chatting to him, and he's like, yeah, yeah. And he's telling me about how the gate opens and closes and all that. Because sometimes we're the first one in. We're in ahead of the coaches because the guy is cool. And I'm chatting to him like that. And he turns around, and just as deadpan as you like, as serious as you like, he just looked at me and he went, yeah, I'm probably like the best gate opener in the world. But he's dead serious. And I'm looking at him, and I'm going, that's the caliber yeah. of nutcase. That works at the US. But that's what you need if you want to be the best. You need the best fucking gate opener. Like, do you know what I mean? Little things like that make it. He yeah. loves his job. Absolutely. And I'm looking around and I'm going, holy shit. And again, you're looking at the imposter syndrome, right? 
Like, I'm at the highest level of this. Mm. And I'm going, what the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> and you're worried that you're going to get found out. Yeah. You know? But then, all of a sudden, you know, Uriah Faber taps me on the shoulder and he's like, hey, Richie, Josh wants you to wrap his hands. Well, okay. So I got a request. I go out the back. I wrap Josh's hands for his uh, world title eliminator against, uh, who was the guy that knocked out uh, Volk? Islam? No, the Spanish dude. Oh, it's a poor, yeah? Yeah. Yes. Josh for him in Melbourne, I think it was. Really? Yeah, didn't he stop him? Emmett? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that was your year, wasn't it? He was fighting Yair Rodriguez. Oh, was he? Yeah, and Volk beat the shit out of Yair. Was that ah, the one in, was okay, that in yeah, Perth? Okay, yeah, okay, yes. Was that UFC Perth? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was Yair Rodriguez. Okay, yeah, so I had to go back and I had to wrap Josh's hands. So then you're, you're getting this reinforced, this positive reinforcement of, oh, God, I'm meant to be here. People like what I'm doing. You know, I'm, you know, I seem to be doing a good job. I think it's just that's a mod being a modest and a normal human being. I feel like you know? imposter syndrome is good for you. Oh, yeah, 100% it is, and you should have it. You know, but again, you know, you need to have... Like, I guess I guess it comes down to, I guess it really just comes down to how you feel about yourself. You need confidence in your ability as well. And it's easy to say that, right? It's easy to say, just be confident. Like, I've got a 16-year-old daughter, I have a 12-year-old son, you know? I can't just say, hey, be confident. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Something you have to learn. And yes, and grow into it and teach and be all that kind of stuff, you know? So when an imposter syndrome does come, and it will, no matter what you do, you know, you'd be able to take a half step back and say, do you know what? You know, I'll give it a go. I'm good at this. I can, I'll be okay. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Well, I won't keep you too long, but if anyone wanted to reach out to Richie, he has a Instagram page now, Complete Fighter Care on Instagram. That's where he'll be posting all of his workshop details and all the cool shit he's doing within the sport of MMA. I appreciate you coming on. Good luck. Are you going to China with Matt in a couple of weeks? Yeah, four weeks. Four so, weeks. Yeah, so my travel is four weeks. So I go to China with Matt. Then I have uh, Melbourne with Complete Fighter Care. Then Perth with the UFC. And then back to China for Road to UFC. Oh, yes, you're doing Road to UFC yeah. as well. Yeah. And do you do Contender Series? No. No? That's all America. Yeah. That's America. Yeah. yeah all right. America. Excellent. Well, thank you for coming on. It Thanks was a pleasure me. meeting you. Oh, yeah, it was good. Uh, we'll do it again one day. Yeah. When, uh, Whenever you want. Yeah, when you're, when you're really big. When, uh, <laughs> thank you. Easy, mate.